Can you believe it? It's finally here. It's the most wonderful time of the year, unless you get stressed out about how to pay for it. Savewithconrad.com can help you make this the best Christmas ever. You won't make a house payment for the next two months. That's right. Skip your next two house payments and use all that cash for your extra holiday expenses. And come next year, you're going to have a lower monthly payment. Don't put Christmas on a credit card. Pay your credit card debt off at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Savewithconrad.com. December 28th will mark the 25th anniversary of Starcade 97, the culmination of a year-long build where Sting would finally step back in the ring to face Hollywood Hulk Hogan for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. The stage was set for a main event to become immortalized in wrestling history, and it did, but for all the wrong reasons. And for the first time in over 20 years on that 25th anniversary, Eric Bischoff and Nick Patrick will reunite to watch back and discuss what really happened that night at the MCI Center in Washington, D.C., hosted by Conrad Thompson, a topic that led to one of the most heated exchanges in the history of 83 weeks. And now you're going to act like it's ludicrous that we might think that that's what happened here when you managed to f*** up the single biggest moment in the history of wrestling, and now 20 years later you get on here and lie through your f***ing teeth and say it's because he wasn't tamed. I'm not lying too much, Chief. You I'm f- just- finish over a tan? Is this real? Ad Free Shows presents a premium watch along event, The Fast Count, with Eric Bischoff and Nick Patrick. December 28th, 10 p.m. Eastern, immediately following AEW Dynamite. All $29 level members and higher are invited to join, and Top Guy members will be able to ask Eric and Nick questions about this controversial night in wrestling. No spray tan necessary. Sign up today and reserve your spot at adfreeshows.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you are listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? <laughs> I, oh, shit. I even got the shirt today. Look there. Cool. Look at that. I'm wonderful, I, man. It's it's the holiday season, Conrad. I'm feeling holidayful. Holiday. It is now, by God. By God, I'm holidayful. So just that, that that's kind of like wonderful of a day inside the holiday. Christmas. Merry fucking Christmas. How's that? Hey, man, I'm for it. Uh, we're coming to you today, or folks are listening to this today on Christmas Eve's Eve. Uh, what's uh, what's on the big agenda for you guys uh, this weekend in the Pritchard household? Ah, we're going to go, and uh, Amber is working at Valentino's, and uh, so we're going to go there for Christmas Eve dinner, and uh, we're not we're not doing anything. And on Christmas Eve, we're just going to go out and eat as a family. And uh, then we'll do a little Christmas morning. And I always forget, see, because we have like this Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's breakfast thing with uh, with family. And two of them are Eggs Benedict, and one of them is Lox and Bagels. And I always forget if Christmas is Lox and Bagels or if it's New Year's. And uh, so I'm kind of hoping we'll do Christmas uh, breakfast, and then we'll go in and open up some presents. And then I'll go back to bed. I like it. I like it. And then I, when I wake up, everything better be down. Oh, really? You want the Christmas decoration down on Christmas day? Well, I always say that last year we uh, pissed my wife off so much that she actually did it. <laughs> it happens. You're still a heel in real life. I am a heel in real life. Yes. I don't just play one on TV. Well, we are going to talk about some of the most poorly played characters in wrestling history today. It's uh it's cause for celebration. I think one of our very first episodes, we talked about the old box of gimmicks. And now here we are 300 and some odd episodes later talking about the box of gimmicks, which may or may not have actually existed. There were some good ideas that came out of there, but not really all that fun to talk about. Let's poke some fun. Let's have some fun talking about the ideas that maybe were a little less than here's one that might actually predate you Outback Jack. Of course, uh, Crocodile Dundee first popped off in 1986 and became a box office hit. And a lot of times we want our wrestling to sort of mirror, uh, the things that, that are happening in, in pop culture and Outback Jack is born after working in stampede wrestling. He's going to come to uh, the WWF full time in 1987. Uh, he appeared in a, a series of vignettes, which were supposed to be set in the isolated Australian outback, even shaving with a knife. 
Uh, what do you remember of, uh, this persona and in hindsight thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle, or what is it? One of those deals where you just kind of had to be there. That's not a knife, mate. This is a knife. Wait a minute. I got a knife in here. Somewhere. There, there's a knife. No, I, I have think this letter one. opener. Oh, here, here's a knife. I got another knife. There's a knife. I, I don't, I don't think that would work. I'll cut you, man. I, I cut you deep. That's, that's like a snub nose. This is a knife. If we're going to do this, that's a knife. And by the way, I got that from bespoke post, the box of awesome. Look at that. It's engraved. That's a knife. Anyway, uh, talk to me about this character. I think he debuts just before you're there, January of 87, uh, in, in Canada. And he finishes up May of 88 in Columbus, Georgia, a house show against Greg Valentine. What'd you think of, uh, the, the man behind the character? I think his real name was Peter Stillsbury. Is that right? I have no idea. Time you can't get rid down sport. Time you can't get rid down. Time you can't get rid down sport. Time you can't get rid down. That was his his music there. That was that was good stuff too. By the way, I you know I came in uh, right after WrestleMania three in nineteen eighty seven, so April of eighty seven, right. and that was kind of you know Outback Jack had been there for a while. I don't think that he was setting anything on fire it was kind of like that damn bell eventually had to ring and outback wasn't the greatest worker in the world seemed like a really nice guy seemed like a very uh naive um guy i think he was a rugby player or something like that but uh big aussie and just a, a sweetheart of a guy the only thing that i really remember about outback is we one of my first TVs, it may have been uh, my first TV after Worcester, was in San Diego, California. And the Bulldogs had been out the night before in the bar and Outback Jack might have passed out. They might have shaved his eyebrows, shaved his head and took the crocodile from the back of his vest that he wore oh. to the ring. And Outback <laughs> was so pissed that the next day people uh, claim to have seen him walking around the hotel and that TV with his knife in his hand, looking for a couple of British bulldogs. Wow. Okay. So, you know, that was kind of one of my first experiences around crocodile old uh, outback Jack. I was going to say crocodile Dundee. That's another guy. And it was my first experience. So it was like, ah, man, this, this guy's a little off balance, but, he, he really, I mean, you got to be off balance anyway to be in this business sometimes. But Outback was a, a big guy. I wouldn't want to fuck with him, man. He was a big, just raw boned uh, fella that I think they took the rib a little too far and he wasn't going to have any of it, mate. I, uh, listen, I know that we can look back and say, well, that was kind of stupid, but it was, you know, based on a popular movie and there have been other. I mean, listen, I get it. Like you want, oh, look, they got a guy. This is getting hot. Let's just try it. And I don't know. Uh, again, I don't know how that guy would have been in the WWF without that persona. Well, and again, you have to understand the business and the business of the business is that you usually had gimmicks that mirrored society at the time, whether it was a Nazi soldier or a Russian you know, leader, what, whatever it is that's going on in society at the time, an Iraqi dictator, whatever it is, your gimmicks usually mirrored what was going on in society at that time. Uh, Paul Hogan and Crocodile Dundee was hot at the time. So people were yearning. They loved the, yeah, they loved that Australian accent. Um, they, they liked the intrigue of down under and, and, not a lot of people had traveled to Australia and that was a, a very cool experience for me when I finally did, but it was, it was intriguing and Americans fell in love with Paul Hogan's crocodile Dundee. So to have a gimmick, to have someone that had that same dialect that could tell stories in that way with that accent and be a big strapping bastard was, was the norm. That's, you know, the business, what's your gimmick kid? You know, when you came in, it's, 
um, no matter where you were, you, you go back in the business, everybody had a gimmick of some kind. And I think that in WWE, especially in those years, the gimmicks were larger than life. They were actually live walking, talking cartoon characters because that was what was being marketed. And that was what was being marketed in to the networks for cartoon series and, and the whole sort. They wanted larger than life characters. So, hence, characters like Outback Jack. Well, here's another, and this is one that we talked about from the very beginning of Something to Wrestle, the Red Rooster, portrayed by Terry Taylor. <laughs> I guess the gimmick is he's a cocksure rooster man with a dyed red mohawk, and he's going to strut his stuff and take on the company's finest. Of course, in real life, Terry Taylor had a good little run for himself in uh, mid South in the UWF. And then when he finally moves up to the big league, so to speak here in the world wrestling federation, he debuts as a baby face, but then turns heel on his partner, Sam Houston, and is rebranded the red rooster with Bobby, the brain Heenan by his side. And uh, mostly the rooster is working uh, house shows with the occasional match on challenge or superstars. He'll beat the likes of Ken Patera or junkyard dog by count out. And eventually he starts to, uh, see that Heenan is arguing that he could turn this inferior rooster into a superstar, demeaning the rooster, stealing the rooster's money, generally embarrassing the rooster on national TV. And after rooster loses a match to Tito Santana on Saturday night's main event, Heenan slaps the rooster that leads to a feud with Heenan's new client, the Brooklyn brawler culminates when Heenan and the brawler attack the rooster on primetime wrestling. And he cut the top of his hair short, dyed it red, spiked it to look like a rooster's hair. And he starts cutting promos that ends with cock a doodle do. Yep. His last major feud is against uh, Dino Bravo. He's going to lose almost every match on the house show loop. And to think this guy almost was Mr. Perfect. I think the debut happens. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, almost Mr. Perfect. Who? Who says that? Who said that? Him. 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 One. So one person says, oh, I could have been Mr. Perfect. No. No. Mr. Perfect wasn't this gimmick that we had. Mr. Perfect was a gimmick that was perfect for Kurt Hennig. And that was something that Pat Patterson had come up with and, and Vince and talking to Kurt because of all the things that Kurt did. Kurt was a outdoorsman. He was a sportsman. He played every sport. He did everything. That perfect gimmick was perfect for Kurt. It was never discussed or even remotely thought of for Terry Taylor. So, you know, if that's something that, that Terry has said, oh, I could have been Mr. Perfect. No, you couldn't have. Because that wasn't that wasn't thought of for you. That was that was one where it was the the talent in Kurt Hennig that made that gimmick. It made him perfect in everything that he did. And I, frankly, I don't think Terry could have pulled that off. So that myth is just that a myth. That was never the case, ever. So when you say, well, he, he could have been. No, he couldn't have been. It was it was not discussed. It wasn't in the cards. It wasn't, oh, well, we're going to do this or this. I can, go, I can go back to Steve Austin and the Ringmaster and Sandman were two gimmicks that we loved. We loved the name of the Sandman, a really smooth wrestler that could, you know, had the sleeper as a finish and different things, but they had to be a real smooth worker. And we discussed Dustin Rhodes for that. We discussed uh, Steve Austin for that. And then, you know, the ringmaster, uh, the master of the ring that could, you know, just out-wrestle everybody and be this incredible technician, which eventually went to Stone Cold Steve Austin. We never did do a Sandman. But that was something where we were we had gimmicks in the back of our mind that we would always think of, hey, who could, who could do this? Not so with the perfect gimmick, not so in any way, shape or form. That was Kurt Hennig and only Kurt Hennig. Um, the red rooster was again, something that didn't necessarily mirror society, but it married, it mirrored the characteristics and the attitude, um, the personality of Terry Taylor. 
Terry was very cocky. Terry was, was, was cocksure. He was a very cocky, arrogant guy. Um, very good in the ring. Very good in the ring. But I think that Terry's biggest, biggest fallback was Terry just wanted to be Ric Flair. Terry wanted to dress like Rick. He wanted to work like Rick. He wanted to, you know, have his gear look like Rick. He wanted to do promos like Rick. There's only one Ric Flair. Go be something new. Go be yourself. Go be something other than a knockoff of something else. Which is why, you know, when Buddy Landell did the Nature Boy gimmick, he's just a cheap imitation of the real Nature Boy Ric Flair. So with Terry's personality, it was... Again, the word cocky kept coming up. And, you know, it was when you look out of the barnyard, who rules who who rules the roost? The rooster. The big fucking cocky red rooster. The, 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 the one that impregnates all the hens. The cock of the walk. I mean, and it, it's a it's a rooster. It's a banny rooster. They walk around with their chest all puffed out. And constantly, you know, that was. The main, the main damn chicken, if you will. And again, is it something that, you know, people, when you look at it uh, just on the surface, oh, the red rooster, that's a stupid, silly gimmick. Well, if if you don't want to get into it and delve any deeper than that, okay, that, that's your opinion. But when you're looking for something to take a, an ordinary wrestler whose gimmick, for lack of a better term, was to be another Ric Flair, but there already was a Ric Flair and they didn't do it as good as Ric Flair. And no matter how good they did, it would have always been compared to Ric Flair. Or you create something new for them and you get people talking. And I dare say that people still today are talking about the red rooster gimmick over any other gimmick Terry Taylor ever did. What was he in, in, uh, in WCW, the hundred dollar guy or something where he tried to rip off Ted DiBiase's gimmick. Taylor made man. Okay. And, and then uh he was was he was he the, the one with the with the computer or he was yeah, Alex out? In New York, Marlena before she was Marlena. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, ripping off something else that had already been done by another guy and done much better. So it was the poor man's version of it. So to that, the Red Rooster was an attempt to make him stand out of the pack. To make people remember, oh, I remember the guy with his hair all spiked up in red and, you know, walking around the ring, strutting around the ring. Guy, guy thinks he's a damn rooster. Right. He's so proud of himself and so cocky and he's so arrogant. He talks about how he's the best and by God is a rooster. You know, I run, I run this here hen house in the WWE. Again, using metaphors and nobody expected him to, to be a, an actual chicken. They expected him to take on the characteristics of what a red rooster would be and to give him some personality and infuse that in him. And I dare say that had Terry embraced it, said it a million times, said it to Terry, had Terry embraced that, that I think Terry would have been one of the biggest stars. And still to this day, he is known for that time as the red rooster. Good, bad, or indifferent. That's what he's remembered for. Not the time of the hundred dollar guy or whatever the hell he was in, in WCW. I think it's worth mentioning too, that there have been some pretty successful gimmicks in wrestling that maybe on paper do sound a little silly. The undertaker's supposed to be dead. Doink the clown. I mean, there's lots of things where people can say, oh, well, that'll never work. But if the performer embraces it, they do. But I do want to ask about the creative, like. All right, set aside the way you feel about the, the gimmick, the persona, the name, the strut, the hair, whatever. Sort of being, I don't know, emasculated by Bobby Heenan, and then we're in a feud with the Brooklyn Brawler and losing the Dino all the time. It, this just thing, it, it feels snake bit. Was that his creative because he wasn't embracing it? Oh, so being a part of Bobby Heenan's family, and being managed by Bobby is emasculating. No, no, no. I'm How just is that emasculating? Well, he's having a feud with a manager, and it's to introduce a new character in the Brooklyn Brawler, who's essentially an enhancement talent. To get the rooster over, he's 
working a program with arguably probably the top heel in the entire company in Bobby Heenan. Yes, agree. And that's and that's emasculating. Well, I, I don't I don't get that at all because again, it was a way to make him, and it was to show the example of um, I'm Bobby Heenan. I can make anybody. I'll take Steve Lombardi, who's a loser, and I'll make him a winner. But yet he couldn't, and the rooster prevailed at every step. But in doing so, I don't think that you know Terry embraced it enough to go you know beyond that because he didn't believe it. He didn't want to be the red rooster. Here's what I'm asking, I guess. First of all, I appreciate you're fired up. I hope everybody's watching on video, something wrestle.com. Bruce fired up is fun. But let's pretend, let's just change the names here. Instead of Rooster losing a match to Tito Santana on Saturday night's main event and getting slapped around by Bobby Heenan and then starting a feud with Brooklyn Brawler, now it's Mr. Perfect losing a match to Tito Santana and getting slapped around by Bobby Heenan and starting a feud with the Brooklyn Brawler. I just don't see that you would have booked the Mr. Perfect character that way. Well, no, because they're two different characters with two different human beings behind the character. No, you wouldn't have booked Mr. Perfect like that, but Terry wasn't going anywhere as Terry Taylor. He wasn't going anywhere as Terry Taylor wasn't working. It was just another guy. We had to create something for him with Kurt Hennig as Mr. Perfect, I dare say, you know, Kurt Hennig, you're, you're talking about two completely different human beings and two completely different performers that put in their gimmicks. It's you're talking apples and pomegranates at that point. He debuts July 12th, 1988, beating Tito Santana in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a house show. He is going to be on pay-per-view for the 88 Survivor Series and the 1990 Royal Rumble. And he's going to leave after he's defeated by Akeem, the African dream in New Brunswick, Canada. Do you think Terry was relieved or disappointed when this run was over? I would say I would bet Terry would have been relieved. I think that Terry, you know, look, Terry didn't like the gimmick. I, I don't think that's any secret. Terry didn't like the gimmick. Terry didn't embrace it. Didn't want to do it. And I think Terry wanted to be Terry Taylor. So, um, but again, that was disproven when he went and became somebody else, um, elsewhere, but it, it, it's like, yeah, I think he was relieved. I think he was happy to be moving on. Um, cause he, he didn't like being a gimmick. Do you, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm picking up just listening to your tone as you discuss this. It feels like you have a hard on for Terry Taylor. No, That's not it. at all. Not at all. Man, Let's Terry and, and Terry and I, you know, and years later, I, I, through the years, Terry and I didn't always see eye to eye, didn't always get along. But again, through the years, you also mature and you realize that, you know, first of all, there's two sides to every story and you take people for what they are. And Terry and I, yeah, if you were to ask, you're asking me my feelings right now. Um, and I'm totally good with Terry Taylor. And I think that we've got a pretty good relationship right now. What time is it, Bruce? Nighttime. Take a look at your watch. Tell me what time it is. Yep. Nighttime. Time to talk about blue chew. Maybe you don't have a hard on for the red rooster. Everybody's got a hard on. Thanks time is time for blue chew. Damn it. God. Well, any time is anytime come on now the nights are getting longer but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff you know the deal this episode and all of our episodes are sponsored by blue chew listen up we all know confidence can take you far in life especially if you embrace it strut around like the cock of the walk maybe it's time for you to be the red rooster maybe when you pop this blue chew we're gonna wake a few things up that's especially true in the bedroom it's time to step up to the plate Think of Blue Chew as like a hot tag for your wiener meat. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take these dudes anytime, day or night. You can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now, the process is simple, y'all. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. 
Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. So if you can benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, <laughs> chew it and do it. Have better sex, y'all. We got a special deal for our listeners. Check it out. Try Blue Chew free. When you use our promo code WRESTLE at checkout, just pay the $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is WRESTLE to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast and giving me a chance to talk about Bruce's wiener here on the show. You like that? That's a good beat right here. You think you think the rooster could straw out to this? Who couldn't? <laughs> there he goes. You gotta see you this. Oh, yeah. That'll help you be the cock of the walk in the red rooster, by God. Cockosaurus, here we go. All right, let's talk about another one of these uh, <clears throat> gimmicks, if oh, you will. We can't just keep music going through the whole thing. Well, we can't. I, I mean, if we no, because can... no, Silva will mess that up. No, 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 Dave, Dave, stop. Hey, you know what? No, let, let's turn it back on. We're talking about a king, the African dream. Bruce, can you do your best to king dance? There you go. There it is. Something wrestle.com. You got to, I know it's an audio show, but it's video too now. Yeah, but I'm a good dancer. And look, that comes through on any medium. It does. It's a vibe. Dance and food. We know that. You know, the real life George Gray, uh, one man gang is reborn as a maybe slightly offensive job talking soul brother from Africa, determined to use his power of his cultural heritage. Wait, why do we have a photo of me up there? I don't know. Anyway, man. um, George Gray, of course. Oh, wait a minute. God damn it. Can you spot oh. the differences? It's, yeah, I, I can't. It's scary. Uh, Gray enters the company in May of 87 as the one-man gang. Of course, he had runs with uh, World Class and Mid-South. Uh, he's going to use that moniker through 88 for appearances on Survivor Series and WrestleMania 4 and uh, he even has uh, a, a world title match against the macho man on Saturday night's main event. But then <laughs> on September 24th, 1988, maybe one of the most infamous vignettes in WWF history. We see the one man gangs manager slick, the doctor of style, bring mean Gene <laughs> to a city alley surrounded by a bunch of dancers dressed as African tribes. People, I guess, I don't know. And Slick is promising to shock the world. And Akeem steps out from behind a flaming barrel. The only way I know how to describe this, these movements are shucking and jiving, which I don't even know if you can say anymore, but it's, uh, a whole new persona. Slick is going to announce that he's been reborn and he's put into the title picture almost immediately challenging Randy Savage for house shows throughout the rest of 88. He goes on to, uh, become a tag team with the big boss man as the twin towers. And then in October of 90, that's all she wrote. He picks up a win over Jake, the snake Roberts and a Harlem street fight at a house show in Maryland and no more Akeem, the African dream in the WWF. So not the longest gimmick in the world. We got about two years out of this. what do you think of, uh, Akeem, the African dream? Well, uh, first of all, not something that we could do today. And, no, uh, clearly. you know, again, sign of the times folks, this was God, 30, more than 30 years ago, a uh, long time ago, different era, but you know, George gray, very entertaining guy in the locker room. And you can't, I would compare George gray to a Paul bearer in the locker room on how he could put, cut promos on people. And just the the wit and and just funny, dry, without even trying to be funny. I remember going to Jamail's Steakhouse in uh, Oklahoma City, and it was it was rare that we we got any time to ever go out and have a nice meal at a decent restaurant. And we had a afternoon show, and so we had the evening off we knew that we would be able to to be out by whatever five or six o'clock and we went to jamail's which was this really nice steakhouse I thought, it's still there in oak city and it was a lebanese steakhouse 
So it was myself, Eddie Gilbert, uh, Keith the Libyan, and Carl Fergie in one man gang. So we we get there, and part of the gimmick was that they bring out these appetizers, they bring out tabbouleh, and they bring out some some other things, and then they bring out fried bologna, which is like man, you know, thick cut bologna, and and it's just fried or barbecued bologna, and it's just thick cut, and it's good. I mean, it's if you like fried bologna. I happen to like fried bologna, but everybody's like, oh, hey, man, the fried bologna, it's great. And everybody's like going crazy about the fried bologna. And, and George just, just takes a bite out and goes, it's just bologna. But the way he said it, and it just kind of, <laughs> we laughed for the rest of the uh, dinner. It George's reaction to all the food that, look, we were just happy to be at a nice restaurant, having a good steak and having a good meal for a change instead of grabbing fast food uh, and eating it in our hotel room. And so everybody's like, oh, hey, man, this is great. And he, and his just reaction was just so, what's so great about this, man? I don't, I don't get it. We're just eating dinner. And that was just the kind of guy he was. He was just a very simple, um, funny, nice, man, one of the nicest guys you'd ever run across as well. So his one man gang kind of been there, done that, looking to rejuvenate his career and get something new and fresh out of him. Um, hence, Akeem is born. And um, I will admit that I, I may have suggested the African dream. As, oh, as, there we go. You know, well, because it, it was like, you know, when we look at it, I said, hey, well, I mean, because when he, when he cut his promos, he did remind me of Virgil. And you're saying like, Dusty Rhodes. You don't you don't mean Virgil like the character. You mean the I real, mean the real human being, Virgil. Yeah, yes. And uh, the way you know he kind of reminded me of that. And I just said, I said, hey, you know, what about you know he's Akeem, he's Akeem, he's the African Dream. And that was just a play because there, there have been American dreams, obviously, and why not have an African Dream? So when you. Did you, you didn't have this persona in mind until you, those words fell out of your mouth, the African dream. No, Akeem was, Akeem was out there. And that was something Vince had come up with and to make him into Akeem, I might've just added the African dream onto it. And just because it was fun. And I mean, he was just billed as Akeem and we just threw in the African dream here and there. And, and people always remember that. That wasn't, I don't know that he was billed as Akeem, the African dream. And people may have referred to him as that, but, uh, that wasn't, you know, something it was just Akeem. I want to remind everybody that Akeem is first going to become a pop culture thing, uh, with the movie coming to America. It came out June 29th, 1988. It's obviously a box office smash with Eddie Murphy playing African royalty and he's named Akeem. And now we've got a character in this persona, mm -hmm. Akeem, the African dream. So maybe a little bit of, maybe. Oh, part of yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, people, people understood that. And, and, you know, looking back, it, it's what, you know, what's that transformation? And, and we're going through all this thing. Vince had this vision of, of doing this, this whole transformation ceremony and everything. And as we, we go on and like, where can we do this? And we actually did it in an abandoned school in downtown Stanford. And in doing so, um, we got the school booked and had everything and we had dancers to you know do the dance and to do the, the tribal dance and we wanted authentic you know african tribal dancers which we got and they were from um university or, or somewhere but they were legit african tribal troops and they took their heritage very, very seriously, which I didn't want. I wanted somebody that understood, hey, guys, we're having fun with this. We're laying into the comedy. Th this is a parody. This is, you know, something that, that is going to be crazy. And I'm, I'm warned day of, I mean, not day of, night of. We're, like, getting ready to lay it out. And I'm getting ready to go over and speak to the uh, choreographer and this guy comes up and says, Oh yeah, they're, they're very serious about this. I, I don't think they're going to, they're going to buy what you want to do. 
And I said, well, I told you exactly what we wanted to do and to find right. me people to do that. I just needed dancers at this point. And so I go over and I meet with this young lady who's absolutely delightful. And she's one of those people, what, what they call a red. And she's looking at me and everything I'm saying, I'm thinking, oh boy, she hates this. Um, and I explained what we're looking for. I said, well, what we're really looking for here is a traditional African tribal dance that turns into the California Raisins. And when I said that, she got the biggest shitting smile, grin on her face. And she's like, I get it. Now I get it. And she's like, well, you definitely do that. And man, it, it was cold <laughs> that night. And they're dressed, you know, no shirts, no tops or anything, and shorts and just um, flip flops. And they were troopers. They were excellent um, and completely understood, man, that when the reveal comes and we play the music and we play Jive So Bro, that uh, we go into a tribal California raisin dance. And I bet it took her less than five minutes to to come up and grasp that and and do what we did, which was just fun. And they were they were awesome to work with. <laughs> I love that the California raisins is what triggered it. It's like bam. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then she was like, oh, okay, I get that. And um uh, it was, you know, yeah, it was a fun shoot. Uh, um just, you know, any, doing that kind of stuff with Gene, which was all tongue in cheek anyway, and slick pro. Um, yeah. So it was a bunch of fun people. But I there was a few minutes there where I was worried, going, oh, man, you got me like legit, you know, people that, that take this very, very seriously and take their heritage very seriously as they should. Um, but now I don't I don't know how they're going to dig this. And I explained the whole concept to her, man. She just stone faced me the whole time until I got to. So then, <laughs> yeah, but it was good. I thought it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Again, not anything we could do today. I don't think that uh, the sensitivity police would allow us to, to do anything like that. He had roughly a two year run here. Is that about all you could expect out of a character like this in reality? Um, I think he could have probably had a, longer run but at the same time i think george was kind of done with the road yeah i mean i've, I've read in interviews uh or maybe i've heard in interviews I, I think the gist was he was gone a lot the travel schedule was brutal yeah and he felt like maybe the payoffs were dwindling but that is sort of the standard in the business at the time business was starting to taper off a little bit in the fall of 1990 do you think he was it was just timing for him you know with the because he's a big fellow doing a lot of travel and, and eventually maybe the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Absolutely. I, I just think he was tired, man. He had been doing it for a while. And what people do forget is that so many of the talent are larger than life. And here was a very large man traveling every day in rental cars, on airplanes, not in first class, usually in coach, having people hit their arms down the aisle as, as they, you know, sit there and, you know, you get up and down and, and it's uncomfortable. It's a grind. And I, I dare say it's more of a grind uh, when you're an extraordinarily large man like he was. So I think that being away from home and being away from his family, I think that he had felt it was time to stay home and be a husband and be a father. Well, let's talk about another extraordinarily big man, Tugboat. <laughs> You know, listen, we've tried to describe what these characters are so far, and I guess he's a goddamn boat. Not a goddamn boat. It's a nickname. <laughs> it's a nickname. You ever heard anybody called Tugboat or Let's, Diesel look. or Tow think, Truck or Mac? Hey, you know, look at that Mac Truck and shit like that. It's Before uh, he, the real life Fred Ottman, Uncle Fred, before he's Shockmaster. He's uh, brought in as Big Man Steel or Big Steel Man with Slick. 
as his manager. Then he becomes tugboat Tyler, then tugboat Thomas, and eventually just tugboat. Do you even remember big steel man? I was tugboat Taylor. Tugboat Taylor. You think? I know we dropped, we dropped whatever the hell last name. was. I don't remember steel man at all. Well, if you're watching on video here, he's rocking a, uh, a red striped shirt, white pants, a sailor's hat. Part of his gimmick, as you as you did. Do you want to show us what he did with the air horn? I mean, can you just visually show us? Yeah. Now this this was also during a time where Vince was experimenting with uh, a writer uh, to write some of the opens and write you know some vignettes and lines for talent things like this. And I would dare say this was some of the hokiest vignettes we ever did. You know, because he's everything. The, the guy was a pun. All he did was puns. He didn't know. I mean, he spoke in puns. Everything was a pun. And so it's like, oh, yeah, I'm midships and uh, going to throw the anchor down. And it was beyond hokey and not good. But, um, you know, Fred did everything he could to, to make it happen. And. There just was there just wasn't that fire in Fred and Tugboat. And I don't think the audience was ready to get behind a a little boat that pulled big ships. <laughs> you feel bad for this one a little bit. I do, I do, because I like Fred. He was just such a nice guy. Um had narcolepsy too, so you'd be sitting there talking to him and he'd be like I don't think he had narcolepsy. My man had sleep apnea and was tired. What's narcolepsy? Isn't that where you just fall asleep? Yeah, I guess. Well, that's what he had. He fell asleep. Uh, I I just got to hear the pitch. Like, do you pitch this idea to Vince Hell McMahon? No. How does it happen? I just, I just can't imagine somebody says, what if, and they do that r- routine you did with the, uh, and all that horse shit and somebody's like god damn it that's it well it was vince's idea i mean it was vince's idea because he was so damn big and so powerful just in general that you could see you know i mean again you look at him tugboat would be a great name for him i think <laughs> dressing him up you know in the little sailor outfit was um Again, you're making larger than live cartoon characters. I think the the outfit was a little um, okay. a little funny. You know? when, you, when he put that hat on, you howled with laughter. Did you not? Ah, uh, it was a little goofy. Let's yeah, the- it, it, it was just it, it was like you know, oh my god, man, really? Because. Again, you're, you're looking, you look at him and, and it's like, especially when the, when the hat's kind of off to the side a little bit and everything. And, and it's just, um, he yeah. looks like big boy. It, it's hard. Yeah, he does look like big boy. That's a, that would have been a great gimmick for him. If we called him Kip <laughs> and he just walked out with a, with a platter with hamburgers on it and shit. And then ate them in the corner in between. Yes, that would be good. Uh, but man, you know, it it was, was what it was. And I, I think that the problem was, is when you look at him, he's got such a friendly face and then he's in that outfit. It's hard for him to be serious, you know, and for you to believe that he's really going to get mad enough to do any kind of damage. So the the curse of of being a a genuinely I, I, good person kind of screwed him over. Well, man, you guys threw everything at it. You know he uh, he debuts with uh, the Hulk Hogan endorsement. The May twentieth episode of Wrestling Challenge, Hulk Hogan does a promo explaining that he personally trained Tugboat and brought him to the WWF. And when Tugboat gets a win on that very same show, Hogan comes after the ring and raises his arm, sort of showing full support for this character. And then, of course, we know when Hogan gets squashed by Earthquake, it's Tugboat who goes on TV and says, hey, send your letters of support for Hulk Hogan here, and we got to keep pulling for him. And you've sort of teased on the show before that maybe one of the ideas along the way for WrestleMania was, what if Tugboat turns on Hogan and becomes an Iraqi sympathizer and we get Sheik Tugboat? 
this is maybe not our best idea. Oh, sign of the times, man. Sign of the times. And the feeling was, is here's this big bastard, you know, uh, and you got to have a big, physically large, imposing opponent for the Hulkster. So, um, Tugboat was huge. So, I think people would believe that Tugboat could beat Hulk. Um just don't think they ever want to see that. And I don't think they would have believed putting uh, him as an Iraqi sympathizer, even, even with Adnan, you know, coming in and, and convincing him. I just don't think that people would have bought it. It's, uh, it's not long for this world. Eventually he's going to turn heel, become typhoon. And, uh, he's got enough of Hulk Hogan. He's going to turn on the bushwhackers, form the natural disasters. And, uh, yeah. Tugboat's first true test is uh, The Undertaker, who got a lot of wins over old Tugboat. Either way, hey, man, he had an opportunity. He did. He did. But it just uh, wasn't in the cards. Next up, we've got one that I don't even remember. Battle Cat. How can you not remember Battle Cat? Brady Boone, uh, born Dean Peters. And I guess later, this character was also Bob Bradley. Uh, Brady Boone, of course, had spent a lot of his time in various NWA territories and even did some stuff with all Japan. And from 87 to 1990, he's going to work mostly house shows against Lanny Poffo, Ted DiBiase, and Rick Rude here. And then he's repackaged as Battle Cat. He appeared very briefly, mostly on house shows, but maybe one more notable appearance on Primetime Wrestling. And he's quickly out of here, going to the UWF global and all Japan. I mean, we've heard for years, Bruce, as you see the visual here on something to wrestle.com that Vince really loved mighty mouse and the character mighty mouse. Was this maybe his first iteration of that concept? Mighty mouse. Yeah, this was, this was one of those attempts at having a character that would appeal to the kids that could fly all around. That was not as big as the rest that had to use high flying maneuvers and everything to overcome larger opponents and whatnot. And the original, the original was, uh, Bob Bradley, uh, Bobcat Bradley. He was the original Bobcat, uh, battle cat. And it was, you know, Bob wasn't all that dependable and had some other issues as well. So, he didn't work out there and Brady Boone was there. Brady was from Tampa or uh, was living in Tampa at the time and came in and, and knew everybody. And I think Hulk was like, Hey, what about Brady who had come in and was doing enhancement work for us as well. So put the gimmick on him and, and Brady was, uh, you know, took that opportunity and, and ran with it. So, it was uh, it was short lived. It, it just I don't think either guy was the type of talent that could take it to the next level. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you, you you have Ray Mysterio. Very few, you know, masked superstars can be able to e- emote emotion through a mask. Right. Ray Mysterio is the master of it. Um, you feel for Ray. Ray makes you feel through his body language, everything he does, his eyes, everything. And, and I think that, uh, that's a, that's an art. And these guys definitely didn't have that art down. And it was just, um, mid card talent, mid card gimmick. Let's take a look at it again here. If we can, I, I'm curious when you see this, Bruce, uh, do you think of not only mighty mouse, but maybe you don't even remember this show Thundercats. When I was a kid, man, Thundercats, I think was around in the mid eighties, maybe through not 89. I just looked it up 85 to 89. It feels like it's borrowing from that. And we've, as we've mentioned, a lot of these ideas are sort of based in pop culture. Was there maybe a Thundercat influence for a uh, battle cat? I, it might've been in, in the design. I have no idea. I don't remember Thundercats. Not your idea though. No. What about this next one? This is uh. This is an idea that, well, we've talked about it before, but I still just, 
I don't know how it came to be. The gobbledygooker. It's going to be something hatched out of a fucking. Yeah. I love when you say it like that. Um, I guess the background here is we, we know that we've got major league sports franchises and they have, you know, mascots. Maybe we need a WWF mascot for the kids and, and something in between matches. I mean, on, on the surface, I get that because baseball, basketball, football, they all have these major sports. They all have a mascot. And you are trying to market some stuff to kids. So I could see it, but Hector Guerrero, maybe you guys didn't think that he could quote unquote, get over on his own. Do you think there was a, an alternate universe where Hector Guerrero wrestles matches as gobbledygooker or would it at best have been silly stuff with like mean gene or Harvey Whippleman or whatever? No, gobbledygooker was never meant to be a wrestler ever. Uh, the Goblin Gooker was going to be a mascot. The Goblin Gooker would be the WWE mascot that you could go to every live event. There would be a Goblin Gooker there. It could be out in the crowd and take pictures with kids and you know, at a certain time and go in and do a little routine in the ring with people. And then uh, Hector Guerrero would work on the live events as El Bandito. Talk to me about, you know, the, the, Maybe I misspoke. I'm not trying to say they're going to have competitive matches, but don't you think there would have been skits? Like, you know, we see physicality with the mascots where they're going to beat up rival mascots or whatever. I could yeah. see gobbledygooker doing that with Harvey Whippleman or some sort. Yeah, we would have had to get there because the, the costume was a little preventative of some of that stuff. But yes, no, that, that was the idea to, to be the mascot and go out and do routines and different things. And yeah, you definitely could have knock a heel on their ass at some point but also it was double duty for hector uh where hector would go out and have matches each uh each night as el bandito and and work and then put the gimmick on or vice versa maybe he was thinking it was uh you know time for a change and if you're thinking it's time for a change we want to tell you about lucy here's the deal boys and girls lots of people choose to use nicotine but there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. Now, not everyone uses nicotine, but if you do, you'll want to listen up. Get ready. This is an ad for Lucy Breakers. If you're one of the millions of adults who use nicotine, you know that not all products are the same. And there's one new product that stands above the rest. Lucy Breakers are the only nicotine pouch that gives you a blast of flavor from the first moment to the last. Each pouch contains a capsule that you break open to release a rush of flavor that doesn't fade away like those other pouches. You know, the ones that rhyme with thin. And they come in so many flavors, mint, berry, citrus, mango, even espresso. And you don't have to go down to the gas station or corner store to get them either. Just order online and they'll be shipped straight to your door. Every order gets free shipping. Plus, if you subscribe, you'll save 15% off and never run out. Now, I have to admit, I don't use nicotine, but one of my best friends at the office does. And man, this time of year, he's usually suffering, trying to fight the wind or the, the cold or the snow. <laughs> Not anymore. I hooked him up with Lucy Breakers and he hasn't looked back. Now at the office, when he's looking for nicotine, he looks no further than Lucy Breakers. So whether you use nicotine while you're working or creating or playing, Lucy Breakers are the intelligent choice. And boy, if we got a special deal for our listeners, get $10 off your first order. That's right. $10 off your first order and use our promo code wrestle at checkout. By the way, shipping always free. That's lucy.co. The promo code is wrestle to receive $10 off and free shipping. Be sure to visit lucy.co for more details. And we thank Lucy for sponsoring the podcast. Now here comes the fine print y'all. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age and every order is age verified. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. One more time, visit lucy.co. Use that promo code wrestle. I don't like this song as much. It's not bad, but the other one was a little more catchy. Yeah. So as we're the other ones like this, this one's kind of like, oh yeah, this is like what I imagine goes through your dog's head as he's going to eat some treats or something. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about the berserker. Actually, do you have a berserker impression? Can you, can you break out a little berserker for us? No. Okay. Uh, if, I tell I tell you what, I, I could, I, I could do the impression and I could just like disappear. 
Oh, that's it's good. Strange that you wouldn't hear from me for a while. Yeah, I'm, did you go join a biker gang and never hear from me again? Yeah, something like that. And then just uh, appear, appear at a convention eventually. So listen, we know the gimmick is a Viking, and I guess this is a Viking that says Huss. Is this a Viking that we can loosely rip off Bruiser Brody for, or what is this? No, it was a Viking gimmick, and I think Nord, just in general, I think always wanted to be Bruiser, and, and Nord just – uh, adopted all that, and we actually tried to get him several times to stop doing that. Um, you know, John Nord was a guy, he came in uh, as Nord the Barbarian. I believe it was Nord the Barbarian. Yeah, it was Nord the Barbarian into Mid-South. And good God, man, you talk about a specimen. Uh, incredible athlete, incredible look, uh, just green as grass. And John was, you know, one of those Minnesota guys, big, tough, and rugged, crazy. Uh, I always got blamed for him walking out in Mid-South because he was last seen with me and Ted DiBiase. And they're not going to blame Ted, so you got to blame me. Uh, but the last, his last known appearance <laughs> was at my apartment on that uh, Friday night, and then we we lost him. We just, we, he Never showed up again for a long, long time, and then brought him in here as a uh, berserker. But it was it was a uh, it was a Viking gimmick, an old world, you know, Norway Viking heritage gimmick, and he just you know tried to adapt all the stuff of Brody and kind of as a tribute to Brody, and uh, did all of his mannerisms and what have you. And, and I think that in many ways, I think that that hurt him. Because those that knew Brody would compare to Brody, and and he wasn't Bruiser Brody. He needed to be Nord, and I do think that uh, he was talented enough that he, man, he could have gone a long way. I could have seen him in programs with you know Hulk and Savage, and you know any top babyface we had because he was believable. Six foot eight, a monster trained by Eddie Sharkey. He's going to go by the barbarian, Nord the barbarian. He's even going to team with Bruiser Brody at different points in his career. He'd work against the Von Erics, work in the Pacific Northwest. But here, as we see, if you're watching over at something, wrestle.com, he's put with Mr. Fuji. And, uh, I guess by this point, Bruiser Brody is no longer with us. Maybe he's doing this gimmick and persona as a tribute, but he's almost a, a clumsy and cartoonish uh viking i don't know um what how many vikings do you know just a few okay he's so, holding his wrist he's licking his hand he's shouting huss he's crossing his eyes he's falling falling flat on his back he even used to bring a sword to the ring and once and stab the canvas was there a bigger upside for this uh, i mean you sort of said you could see him with this guy or that guy why didn't that happen? Is it because he was just well, I, because John was, yeah, John was crazy. <laughs> John <laughs> still is crazy. I imagine I haven't seen him in years, but, um, lovable guy, but just, you know what? He, he lived life, man. He lived life to the fullest and didn't always take things as seriously as he probably should have. And wasn't, wasn't reliable. And he was one of those guys that went on the European tour and didn't come back. So yeah, that was kind of that, you know, to me. I was like, yeah, at least I wasn't on the tour, so they could blame me. Um, but that was that was his mo. So he wasn't really reliable. So it's kind of hard to get behind somebody like that. They've got to prove themselves, and and just when they get to that point of hey, this could be next, then doesn't work. You sort of said before that there were certain guys that you ran across in wrestling who were sort of scared of success. Maybe you've used different phrasing, but that's certainly the the implication in July of 92, our man, the berserker wins a 40 man battle Royal on primetime wrestling and is going to get a, a shot to challenge Bret Hart for the, uh, the WWF championship that November. But before we get there, after he won that one in July of 92, as we all know, in August of 92, he just disappears after SummerSlam 92, but he does get brought back. It's not like that's when he's fired. He gets that match against Bret Hart, uh, in November and, uh, his final appearance is in February of the following year, February of 1993. He's going to appear one last time in a battle Royal on Monday night raw. And that's all she wrote. 
he's one of those characters, man. You just think about the size and the opportunities with a Hogan. Yeah, I, I get it. He could have, he could have been a much bigger deal. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, talent are their own worst enemies. And in this case, I think John was his own worst enemy in that regard, but you know, he's been successful. He's got a car business in, I believe Minneapolis, um, does some extremely entertaining commercials. You check those out you know, if you can, Nord, Nord autos. Um, it's, you know, Hey, you know, got no credit. We don't care. You got no money. We don't care. You don't make your payment on time. We care. Um, just good fun stuff. And, and he's a hardworking guy. So, I mean, he's one of those people that will always survive, but you have to think, you know, what could have been with him. Got no credit. We don't care. No down payment. We still don't care. Don't make your payment. That's right, then we care! We're Nord Motor Company, located a mile west of Anoka on Highway 10. And with payments as low as $82 a month. That didn't hurt much, did it? Well, we know what could have been with Mike Rotundo. He's going to come in here as Erwin R. Scheister, IRS. This feels like a character out of Mad Magazine. Uh, the gimmick is he's a former tax collector from Washington, D.C., He's going to start harassing wrestlers and fans and calling them tax cheats and telling them they've got to pay their fair share. Of course, we've seen him before in the WWF. He was a tag champ way back when with Barry Windham. And, uh, he was a member of the varsity club over in WCW and, uh, he was actually Michael wall street in WCW before leaving there to become IRS here in April of 91. So he's doing a, another failed million dollar man rip off gimmick. And then he comes into this promotion and man, what do you know? He starts teaming with the real million dollar man. He's pushed as a major heel and he actually goes uh, the third longest in the 92 rumble behind only flair and Piper. Uh, but I guess maybe the, the highlight is him teaming with Ted DiBiase. They become money Inc. Even work a WrestleMania match against Hulk Hogan and Brutus beefcake, which is a big deal and becomes a part of the million dollar corporation and even gets to wrestle the undertaker at the 95 Royal rumble, which we've sort of joked about on the show before was death and taxes. If they ever became a tag team these days, we know he's uh, working behind the scenes in wrestling, but this gimmick, this persona, I R S a little too hokey, a little too cute. Or did you like it? Loved it. It's great. You got a guy named Irwin R. Scheister who works for the internal revenue service. So well, great name. Great name, great gimmick, and, and that's something. Everybody hates the IRS. Yes. Do you, do you like the IRS? Is, is it like the the evil dentist gimmick? Isaac Yankum, the evil dentist. Everybody hates the dentist. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's kind of the same line of thinking, right? Yeah. But I think that uh, Mike was able to pull off uh, Urban R. Scheister a little better, had more experience and a little bit more poise. It that this point in his career versus Glenn at that point in his career for the dentist. Um, so Urban R. Scheister, uh, tremendous gimmick. Oh my God, everybody hates the IRS. And then you see a guy who's standing up there looking like he looked telling you to pay your taxes. Um, everybody hates that. Everybody hates that. Not just April 15th each year. You hate that all year long and then to have some guy shoving it down your throat and be able to back up his words. And that was the thing, you know, Mike Rotunda, double tough uh, in real life, man. Uh, unbelievable accomplished wrestler, uh, amateur wrestler, but also tremendous uh, in the ring. And he got the entertainment side of everything. And you couldn't see through anything that Rotunda did. So, yes, um, man, Mike was fabulous in his role as IRS. And I... I I thought that the gimmick was great and I thought that he pulled it off. Well, and it's one of those that everyone still remembers. Well, and what's great about it is I think we both agree that Mike was, was a very good in-ring wrestler, but his, I mean, he hasn't necessarily wowed us on the microphone or with his personality or his character work before he becomes IRS. But once he's IRS, I do feel like that's where he's most remembered. Much like you made the point about Terry Taylor. 
think when people think of Mike Rotundo, more often than not, they think about the IRS character. And it debuts right before you leave, I believe, in April of 91. Would you would have helped put together that look, the short sleeves with the suspenders and the briefcase and the whole thing? Yeah, I, I did all the vignettes for IRS, his introductory vignettes. We actually shot those in the offices at the studio. Um, and I shot all of those. And then, uh, by God, I was gone shortly thereafter. But uh, I think that, again, this was a great example, as you just said, of a talent that embraced the gimmick. Yes. And you can say, oh, I'm Mike Rotunda. I'm Shooter Boy. I'm this, I'm that. And instead, he looked at the uh, idea and, think people could say oh that's a silly gimmick irs well no it's not if you embrace it you become you become <laughs> irs he became Irwin r shyster you know and he believed it so you believed it and that that's that's the art man that's what makes the difference so rotunda got that and was very entertaining being Irwin r shyster and you believed him so i to me, I thought the gimmick was great, and it's one of those that will live on in infamy. I love the uh, the look. You know, short sleeve with a tie and suspenders and a briefcase and those little reading glasses. Like, everything about it feels like, hey, I don't know what it is, but I don't like that guy. Easy uh, to hate. Very easy to hate, but something that's easy to love. Oh, I know, what, I know what's easy to love. You want to know what's easy to love? What's that? Smooth balls. <laughs> yes, sir. Come yeah. on, fellas. This episode of Something to Wrestle is brought to you by our favorite producers of ball hair trimmers. We're talking about Manscaped. The global leaders in below the waist grooming are leaving 2022 with brand new products the Preserve Cologne and Preserve Body Wash. 2023 is the year to up your hygiene game and smell amazing. And Manscaped wants to help you with this special offer. Go to manscaped.com forward slash STW for 20% off and free shipping. Take the leap into the new year and join the 7 million men who already trust Manscaped. Now, 2023 is on its way. And the last thing you want is to be the guy with pubes getting in the way of making it your best year yet. Manscaped's Lawnmower 4.0 is the leader of the Performance Package 4.0, or as we call it, the perfect package for your package. See, this new year, we want you to shave the loose pines off your wood with the best tool for the job, the Signature Lawn Mower 4.0. Maybe you're having trouble dealing with the wild weeds in your nose and ears. Well, Manscaped's got you covered. I love the Weed Whacker. You will, too. I use it all the time. I'm actually sleeping better. I think that might actually have something to do with it. Not kidding. I also think confidence is going to be king in 2023. You know what I'm confident about? You're going to smell like a million bucks if you uh, you check out Manscaped's brand new Preserve Body Wash and the Preserve Cologne. You're going to feel clean. You're going to feel good. You're going to smell good. And it's going to check all your boxes, you see. We're talking about a daily grooming routine, but in the shower. The body wash has this light, woodsy scent. It's infused with aloe vera and sea salt, too, so it's going to keep you feeling nice and clean and moisturized. But the cologne, much like the body wash has that same light and woodsy scent too. So you're going to feel like you've answered the call of the wild. It's going to leave you smelling like a man that was forged from the earth. By the way, these products are cruelty free, dye free, paraben free, and vegan. So you know you're in the right hands and smelling good too. Go to manscaped.com forward slash STW. Get yourself 20% off plus free shipping. Y'all 2023 is on its way. The woods are here and smelling amazing. You ready to jump in? Join me with Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com forward slash STW. That's 20% off with free shipping by going to manscaped.com forward slash STW. Bruce, happy new year to your balls. God bless America. Merry Christmas and smooth balls for the new year. It's a ball cutting music right here. Uh, somebody needed their balls cut for Skinner. Steve Kern is going to play an alligator hunter. I guess he's from the Florida Everglades. Originally portrayed as a generally nasty individual, always chewing on tobacco and sometimes even spitting it on his opponents. He carries an alligator claw to the ring with him. I'll even sometimes use it as a weapon against his opponents. And I guess we should remind everybody that I was first made 
aware of him with, uh, teaming with Stan Lane and the fabulous ones. And maybe that's still his claim to fame, but boy, Skinner was a, was a national brand here. He debuts in the summer of 91. He gets a big opportunity against Bret Hart at Tuesday in Texas and an intercontinental title match. And of course he loses. He does get a chance to put over Owen Hart at WrestleMania eight. He's going to work with Randy Savage, uh, for the title on primetime wrestling in June of 92. And one of his last appearances was in the rumble in 93. And eventually he's going to get a chance to be a uh, doink until he's out of there in 93. And we know he's done a bunch with and around the WWE since behind the scenes, but the Skinner persona, I know you weren't there necessarily when it debuts, but what'd you think of it? I thought it was great. And this is a perfect example of taking someone for who they truly are and blowing it up and turning the volume up to a hundred because Steve Kern is, was an alligator hunter. That's, that's what he does still to this day. Steve will go out and hunt alligators, get permits from the state when they have open season on, on the gators and you can get, you know, so many gators per permit and everything. And that's, that's what Steve did. So he did in his spare time as we did for fun. And, um, He's Skinner, <laughs> you know, so th this was just taking the real life person, turning the volume up and presenting him as a character, larger than life character. Uh, it wasn't a departure at all for who the real human being Steve Kern was at all. And it wasn't much of a gimmick because it just was was Steve. Being Steve on character on on uh, television with a different name, so that that one was easy. That's a to me a no brainer. Well, I don't know if this next one's a no brainer. The Repo Man. I wasn't there. I wasn't even there. How does this get greenlit? Do you think? I mean, I understand. Like you said, everybody hates the IRS. Okay, all right. Everybody hates the Repo Man. I get that. But I mean, after the smashing success, pardon the pun, he had as de as one half of demolition. This is maybe the worst follow up act of all time. Oh bullshit! What's you what? telling me that Blacktop Bully and the Golfer are better than Repo Man? Well, it, listen, it was all downhill after Smash. Can we agree? Uh, I liked him. As, I I I liked him as uh, Crusher Darso. Well, that was Crusher before Chef, whatever the hell Crusher was. Chef was first. And then, Crusher Chef, well, yeah, that was to me the, the top for him. You like that better than Smash? I like Smash too. I love Smash. Okay, they're equal. Repo Man sucked, though. Can we agree? Repo Man was entertaining. It was entertaining. You got to admit. I, and again, I wasn't there for much of anything of Repo Man, but I, lo I love Barry. Um, it was, it was a fun gimmick. I mean, it was, it was stupid. <laughs> hey, it's a repo man. He goes and he take the repossess the car. He take your watch and whatever. If you don't pay. When you take a look at this character, it looks like it's a dude in a Zorro mask with tire tracks on That's his. So you gear. don't know who it is. Well, but at the same time, he, his persona, like his mannerisms feel like the Riddler. Like maybe his inspiration was if Zorro and the Riddler had a baby who needed a real job. I don't know. It's weird. A little bit. I mean, yeah, is this... it was just, it, that was just, yeah, a stretch. It was, that one didn't have longevity all, written over it at all. Yeah. Listen, uh, the vignettes air November 9th on primetime wrestling is going to be hired by Ted DiBiase to help defeat Vir uh, Virgil for the million dollar title. So it's repo man and Ted DiBiase. I guess that makes sense. He takes part of the rumble 92. He's in WrestleMania eight teaming up with the Mountie and the nasty boys. And then he starts a program with the British bulldog through the spring and summer and Somehow he repossesses the macho man's hat. I guess he was behind on his hat payments. Yeah. That happens. Savage was making payments. On yeah. His hat. On his hat. It's an expensive hat, dude. 
I mean, were people just smoking dope? Well, well, how does this happen? Hat payments? You don't have hat payments? Nope, never had a hat payment. Dude, remember when I got that that one mortgage loan from you? That was, was for a hat. hat. That was for the hat. We got to see this hat. Oh, well. Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, Barry Darso has said that he sees Repo Man becoming like a heroic character. I don't know about that. I don't know that there's a baby face Repo Man. It's hard for me to wrap my head around. He leaves in March of 93. Buddy. Anything redeeming? Anything good about the Repo Man we can share at all? No, I, I think that, yeah, that was... One of the worst. Time, I think. That, that was not good. Yeah, we uh, it's, we probably, it's it's up there in the top five of, of the worst. I would argue that we could put nails on the list of box of gimmicks, but we did a whole episode on him, and that's in the archives if you want to check it out. But the storyline that you rolled out as a companion for the big boss man, man, y'all did a pretty good job on that. Uh, I don't think you were there necessarily. I probably, wasn't, but. They did a pretty decent job of it. Papa Shango, though, I know if I put that on the list, you're going to take great issue with. You loved Papa Shango. I did love Papa Shango. Papa Shango was excellent. Excellent gimmick. I loved it. And uh, I thought that uh, he could have. That's one of those that you could bring back from time to time and have a lot of fun with. Voodoo go Master. Go check out our Godfather episode uh, from earlier this year. Let's talk about another sort of what if. This is a big one. Max Moon. Now, the way Conan tells the story, Vince McMahon saw some sort of anime cartoon robot on TV while he was in Japan that shot confetti and fire. And allegedly, the WWE pays like 13 grand for this outfit that has the circuitry and pyro gun that's going to shoot sparkles into the crowd. It, it undergoes some various changes. But as I've even heard it described from Conan, man, it would have been cool to see a jetpack where he flies to the ring. And that was this grandiose idea that of course never really happens. Um, well, I mean, is this a cyborg from outer space or the future or how can you describe this max moon character? You know, I, and again, I wasn't there, uh, for that. However, I have heard all the stories from both sides and it was, this elaborate, and, and I don't know, I, I think it was stemming from a meeting with Conan and Vince where they were brainstorming and kind of came up with this Maximilian Moon gimmick. Uh, the the outfit was insane, and, and we actually had it, and it, it's like, you know, you'd shoot it, and little spurts of pyro would come out, and steam would come out, and all this other crap, but it was... <laughs> to try and carry that thing around from town to town would have been brutal. I mean, I would rather have the snake than to have to carry around this outfit. And then the, the upkeep, you know, one thing goes out, it, it's, it was crazy, but also things just didn't work out with Conan and it became, we have this outfit, we have these, this gimmick, you know, can we put somebody else in it? Enter Paul Diamond, who, who wore the gimmick for a while, but it was really never amounted to anything much more than a, than a mid card attraction. And it was, I think with Conan in it, especially at the time Conan was, was really hot in Mexico. So, um, I think Conan would have, would have added a lot more panache to that gimmick for whatever reason, just with his style and, and his natural charisma. I just want to remind everybody that this actually, this Max Moon character comes out just barely before the Power Rangers, but Vince was probably onto something that this sort of look and feel could have appealed to kids, but timing is off. You know, yeah. uh, Conan is, is a top guy in Mexico and he's doing, you know, soap operas and I mean, he's a TV star and he's here working in a downtime for the WWF. So I'm sure there's lots of travel. It's probably very cumbersome to haul all this shit around. And probably not making nearly as much money. It's just easy to. Yeah. You know. Well, no, Conan never even started. Conan yeah. never even started. He he did the tryout. He worked in it maybe one time, and and that was it. Uh, as far as I know, I don't, I don't think he was ever 
ever on full time. And he had a great gig in Mexico. Yeah. So he was going to continue that. Well, uh, I don't think we should sleep on this, uh, this Max Moon character, because I think, I really do think that something like that could have worked. And I know that, you know, we couldn't do the jetpack thing and blah, blah, blah. But I think with a lot of these ideas, it just comes down to timing. Does it not? It comes down to timing. And it also comes down to the, the human being portraying the character. If it's the right, the right person and they can get it over and have that extra personality to, to make it larger than life that happens. And if it's just somebody kind of putting on the suit, doesn't always work. And so it is as much, you know, the, the person behind it as it is the gimmick to bring it to life. Next up, Giant Gonzalez. Yes. I'm disappointed in myself because uh, if I had been planning a little better, this would have been where we do our Manscaped commercial because our man, Giant Gonzalez, he definitely could have used it. Take a look at that. Yeah, he was a big one. How long do you big think man. he could get rid of all that hair in his crotchal region? Well, probably too bad. I mean, if you're a giant, I mean, you, it's going to grow right back. Oh, the, the giants grow crotchal hair faster. Yes. Oh, that's a known fact. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I, Rick Flair told me that he thought Andre, the giant had two rows of teeth. So I could see how maybe there was another thing we didn't know, which is he did. He has many, as many teeth as a shark. Great. white. you how many shark teeth are there? A lot. a lot, a lot. Okay. Well, a great white has as many teeth as Andre the Giant. That's uh, right. Same, same. Yeah. So the gimmick here for Giant Gonzalez, let's throw it back up there, Silva. You can take a look at this at something to wrestle.com. You can see as he's standing next to downtown Bruno there, quite the size difference. The former Eligante here is now a dude in a bodysuit that makes him look more muscular than he really is. And he's got airbrushed muscles and bushy hair on his shoulders and his calves and his hips and his no, no area. Yeah. Nearly an eight foot tall fella here. He's going to debut at the rumble in 1993. And I guess he's got to be one of the odds or, or the undertaker has got to be one of the odds on favorites to win that. But instead giant Gonzalez eliminates him. And that leads to a WrestleMania nine match where he would use chloroform and be disqualified against the undertaker. And I think there was even an angle shot between him and Hulk Hogan on the return tour. He turns baby face after Taker beats him at SummerSlam. And his last appearance is a 20 man battle Royal on Monday night raw for the vacant IC title. Based on everything I've heard from everyone, George was a nice man, but this was a bad idea. George was a very nice man. Very nice. Um, very naive, did not understand the business. Uh, I think Ted Turner was just trying to get his money out of him because he brought him over from Argentina to play for his basketball team in Atlanta. And that didn't work out. Well, I'll make him a wrestler. Um, that didn't work out. <laughs> so then I tell him, I'll make a giant. Um, that didn't work out. And look, he was damn near eight feet tall. Yeah. He spoke Spanish. He um, was an interesting, I mean, he had an interesting story, you know, as a kid growing up and getting out of Argentina to play basketball and what have you, that that's pretty cool life story. But Dan, that damn bell had to ring at some point and he just did not have a feel, did not have any instinctive ability to understand what to do in the ring and try as you may, he wasn't going to get it and is an attraction for people to come and look up at and go, Oh my God, he's huge. That's kind of where it ends. I'll tell you a story about, uh, Jorge is we, we were at, um, I believe we were in LA and we had flown in together. It was Vince and Pat actually shit. No, I take it back. We come back from LA into JFK and, Jorge was on the flight with us. Sergeant Slaughter was working in the office at the time. Sarge was kind of babysitting uh, Jorge. And we get 
to JFK. We're waiting on our bags and Vince and I are out by the car and we're getting ready to get in the car. And this guy walks up to me and says, Hey, excuse me, are you uh, with the wrestling people? And I said, yeah. And he hands me his card and he was uh, an executive, I believe for Paramount studios. And he says, um, your, your giant in there is, um, pretty much an asshole. Oh, I'm sorry. And he says, yeah, he goes, I went up and, uh, said hello to him and got my son here and I just wanted to get a, get an autograph. And he kind of blew us off, but very rudely blew us off. And, you know, I started looking at the card and, and he was, he was a big deal at, at, at the studios and everything. And Vince is overhearing this and Vince comes over and introduces himself to him and says, um, where's your son? And he says, oh, he's, he's over there. He goes, I, it's okay. And I says, no, bring him over. And comes over, introduce, you know, say hello to the son, take some pictures, uh, give him some autographs. <laughs> and then he says, Bruce, go, uh, go grab the giant. And I went in and I uh, grabbed him and I told him, I said, Hey man, you know, you offended these people that said you were rude. And the guy's an important guy out in Hollywood. You never know who you're talking to. And that, that was the lesson there is don't be an asshole. Don't. And, and his thing was, he thought he needed to be that way because he was a heel. And you didn't, you, you never needed to be that way because people, people don't always know, and you don't have to be a heel outside of the business. So uh, he went and said, hello, apologized to the guy and gave the kid an autograph. But, you know, that was, that was the important lesson learned for him is like, you never know who you're sitting next to right. on a plane, or you never know who's coming up to you. They may be, you know, dressed like a bum. And that could be a advanced CIA agent, you know? Um, so it treat everybody with respect and, and try to be as nice as you can. Because again, it, it, you just never know who it is. Could be, you know, could be anybody and there's just no reason for it. So he, he learned a, an important lesson that day and, and that was good. That was an important thing for him to learn, but he just didn't, man, he just didn't have it and didn't understand. And he didn't, I don't think he really wanted to understand. He didn't really want to be in the business per se. Well, I, uh, I think there is a good lesson there that if you're, if you're nice to everybody, you'll, you'll sleep better at night and you'll sleep so. better at night. If you're using chili sleep, baby, yep. come on now. We love our chili sleep around here. I got eight hours of sleep last night. I give all the credit to Chili Sleep. Science tells us the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering that core body temperature. Temperature controlled sleep is going to repair your muscles after a hard day's work. It's going to improve your cognitive functions. You always start your day feeling sharp and alert. By the way, Sleep Me is the new home for Chili Sleep. Same great sleep, but under a new name. Sleep Me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper, more restorative sleep. Chili Sleep makes the Uller, the Cube, and the Doc Pro sleep systems. They're water-based, temperature-controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide you your ideal sleep temperature. Think of it as like a smart thermostat for your bed. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. Sleep Me systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. And hey, y'all, listen up. They just launched the brand new Doc Pro system. This is fantastic. It has two times, two times more cold power than the other models. It's whisper quiet. And it has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Pair it with the new Sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling. My wife does that. She gets into a warm bed and then it cools her off as she sleeps. So she doesn't get all hot and sweaty. Then it warms her up to wake her up. How do you beat that? It's automatic. Head right now to sleep.me forward slash wrestle to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for something to wrestle with listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep. S L E E P dot me 
slash wrestle to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. Sleep.me forward slash wrestle. Look at Bruce go. He's dancing because he's sleeping good, boys and girls. Sleep.me forward slash wrestle. Don't sleep in our YouTube. If you're not seeing Bruce dance, you're missing out. Something to wrestle.com. Bruce, let's see if you keep dancing when I say these two words. Rio Rogers. <laughs> Let me describe the gimmick. Number as one of all time worst gimmicks ever. Really? Yeah. So it's like a Dusty Rhodes parody. Shitty no- as shitty as the person that came up with it. Go ahead. Dusty Rhodes parody, over the top Fu Manchu mustache, uh, old chaps, some canned Dusty isms. Only last two weeks in the WWF in 1993. Two weeks as a, long. As a reminder, Jerry Lawler is uh, off of superstars while he's figuring out his lawsuit down in Memphis. And the broadcast needs a replacement to do color commentary alongside the chairman. Around that same time, Jerry Jarrett reportedly heard Bruce Pritchard's impersonation of Dusty Rhodes and suggested a character based on the impression he thought that, that character could fill the spot. As the legend goes, Vince Green lights it. And Rogers even briefly receives his own interview segment. Rio's Roundup is one and only guest with Shawn Michaels in the lead up to Survivor Series 93. Of course, Shawn is replacing Jerry Lawler in that affair. Man, listen, desperate times, desperate measures. No, is this uh, the least fun you had in wrestling? <laughs> this is regrettable. Good looking, son of a bitch, that guy. Handsome as fuck, I'll be honest. Yeah, nice chaps, too. I think it moved. You know whose chaps those were? Terry Funks. Terry Funks. But I stole them from Dusty Rhodes. So Dusty stole them from Terry. Dusty stole them from Terry. I stole them from Dusty. Tom wore them in there somewhere. And then I loaned them to Vince for a shoot, and they got lost. You think Vince still has those? Probably, man. He probably wears them every night, bastard. Can you imagine if if he, but during the WBF days, I guess that was right before this, but it would have been hilarious to see Vince like posing with those on. He, he wore them. He wore them for something. Yeah. Yeah, He definitely wore them for something. Well, it could have been worse. They could have made you Fryer Ferguson or Bastion Booger. Boy, if it wasn't for bad luck, old Mike shot have no luck at all. These are two terrible gimmicks for the same. Poor soul. Fire Ferguson, as I understand it, is a mad monk that wrestles barefoot and uses his robes to smother opponents. Meanwhile, Bastion Booger, AKA Dave Silva is a disgusting food obsessed booger man that rubs his fat belly. As he walks to the ring, carries mysterious cans of food that he's going to eat after winning matches. And I think he just like smothers his opponents with his taint as his finish. This is, I can't believe Vince liked a bastion booger that everything we know about Vince was that he would be disgusted by this. You're welcome. This is your idea. Well, hang on now. Uh, the fryer, the mad monk shit just didn't work. You know, that was awful. Whose idea was that? Who can we kill? I was either Vince or Pat, one of the two. Um, but, but also, you know, Mike Shaw came in and he was horrible horribly out of shape um a shell of of what he had been before he used to be able to move as a big man and could work and he came in just slow and just huge just in in terrible absolutely horrible 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 shape um the monk outfit you know hit all that and when that didn't work, we we got some you know bad feedback from religious groups and things. So it was okay, we're not going to have a mad monk. Um, what do we do with him? I said, well, you know, since he did come back in such horrible shape and he looks horrible, do you make that a positive and accentuate that and put him in an outfit that makes him look even worse and you know, we started thinking about all that, different things. And and as we're going through, what do we call him? And I jokingly said, 
What about Bastion Booger? I'm thinking of like the nastiest, grossest. Yeah, think of the guy that, that uh, Sebastian, I think is his name. But anyway, he looked like a Sebastian. Sebastian. Uh, you see the uh, Underwood Deviled Ham commercials? You know right. what I'm talking about? Yeah. Our older viewers will know. And I just I was like, you know, Bastion Booger. It's disgusting. It's gross. And put him in that outfit and let him be gross. Let him gross people out. And that was the idea behind it. And I think he did. I think he accomplished that. What what do you um what do you remember, if anything, about the monk deal? From what I understand, he has w- just one match, and then there's some criticism from the Catholic Church. So we transitioned to Bastion Booger. Is that the way yeah. you remember it? Yeah, we couldn't do the monk thing anymore, and then we we said, okay, what are we going to do with him? So Survivor Series '93 is the only pay per view he's on before he slides go. down the card and he's released in August of '94. Well, yeah, I've told the story about him being released before he came to Pat and I and said, oh, I'm not getting, I'm not getting booked enough. And if I, you know, I can't get booked, I'm going to, I'm going to need to leave and everything. I need, uh, I can make more money on the outside. And I said, well, there's Vince's office right there, man. Go in and, and talk to him. And he walked in Vince's office and he came out. And Pat and I are still sitting right outside talking and we said, okay, you feel better now? Really good. And he goes, well, no, I, I told him I, I couldn't continue doing this. I needed more bookings and, the, you know, I'd do better, you know, working somewhere else. And he said, okay, I finish up next week. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Well, do you feel better? Right. You know? I was like, no. you know, that, that was kind of the rule, man. Don't go in and tell Vince you could do something better elsewhere because, okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for. He got it. Well, another guy who got it and basically every other gimmick, Abe Knuckleball Schwartz, going to be portrayed by Steve Lombardi. He's a disgruntled baseball player looking for competition. Probably number two on the all-time worst gimmicks ever. This, of course, is an idea born because uh, Major League Baseball is on strike through 94 and 95, and uh, he's going to wear baseball-themed face paint, as you see here on somethingtowrestle.com, in a baseball uniform with a the number double zero and he comes to the ring to, uh, take me out to the ball game. Of course we all remember the Brooklyn brawler. Well, this is the second version of, uh, Mike Lombardi here in the company. Mike Lombardi. Who the hell's that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Steve Lombardi. Lombardi. Yeah. 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 Mike Lombardi's a promoter in the Northeast. I don't know. Uh, earlier, an earlier version of this gimmick appeared briefly in 93 as MVP. Not the MVP we know, but most valuable player. Um, Schwartz here, Abe Knuckleball Schwartz. He's only around from May to November of 94. What'd you, what? Uh, yeah. He was around that long? Yeah. No way. Long, isn't it? It's way too long. Oh my God. It was the drizzling shit. Who, who, how does it come to be? Uh, Lombardi had this idea about, you know, what if I was a baseball player and I painted my face like a baseball? And that was it. We went with it. We did these horrible vignettes. There's like the Lou Gehrig uh, speech. It it was terrible. It, it It was brawler with white face paint on. It was terrible. What about your man, Quang? I don't really know even what the hell this is. We're going to incorporate some, I guess it's like mysterious Asian wrestlers, you know, like there's some influence from that, like the great Kabuki and I don't know. Kabuki. He he is going to do mist. He's going to do a martial arts move set. Uh, of course, not actually Asian. I don't believe, um, the vignettes air weeks. He has vignettes that air weeks before his TV debut. The first match is January 22nd, 1994. He's managed by Harvey Whippleman, which was almost a sign right away that this is not going to get over. Uh, a fourth man to enter the 1994 Royal Rumble. Yeah, just lasts until April of 95. In the meantime, he's going to put over Bret Hart, Razor Ramon, The Undertaker, and Hakushi, but less than ideal. Quang, how, how, 
what this is the box of gimmicks is it no, great guy loves loves business and, and you know we had uh you know savio had such a kind face and you know even in puerto rico they had to paint his face and he was tnt there he had come to watts uh, to work in mid-south we made him el casario there which was the the mask gimmick and everything kind of martial arts he had a martial arts background and that was the style that he worked so let's you know make him a martial artist uh, that, that was the thinking behind it uh put a mask on him and then you know th thankfully we got the mask off of him and made him sabio vega yes. here eventually but um it was, it was an experiment way to give a guy a job and and try something else that you know had been done before uh, with the El Casario gimmick. There wasn't much deviation from that other than the presentation and, and the name. Uh, Quang, if you, if you just Google meaning, means deer or light. Are you guys just making shit up or did somebody actually look that up? He's a light. Jesus. He was just, just freaking bullshitting us here. He's the light. Quang. The light. Oh. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Are these your Quang moves right now? No, ask me about ready to, to fuck you up. With your 17 time karate black belt hall. It's only four time. And uh, fuck y'all for not taking it seriously. I, I really don't give a shit anymore. Do you have the canceled checks, all four of them? For what? You know, where you made a donation to get that. Honor. Didn't need to make a donation. My donation was in my contribution to the martial arts. Can we see footage of that next week on the program? I'd love to see some of these contributions and just highlight it and celebrate it. Your no, moment. you can't. You know what? You can't because you don't deserve to. <laughs> I love you for that. Hey, you serious business. Yeah, can you can you sort of lay out like what it might have sounded like, Vince trying to describe the Quang character? It's Quang. That's it. I love it. Mm. Quangy. Yeah, Quangy. He's a light. Well, I don't know how we'll make light of this one. Fantasio? Oh, fucking hell. I was just telling this story last night. Harry Del Rios. This is a, an illusionist who distracts opponents with magic before defeating them with his technical prowess. Of course, he was actually the spellbinder in the USWA for a couple of years, 93 to 95. He makes exactly one TV appearance. Goddamn right he did. Against Tony DeVito of DeVito. one too many. It's our episode of Wrestling Challenge, July 16th, 1995. In Pennsylvania here, we're going to have a, a magician enter the ring wearing a mask that is identical to the face paint he has on underneath, which maybe makes no sense. I don't know. Uh, but he's going to distract Tony DeVito with some streamers and then pull the underwear off of both DeVito and Earl Hebner. And he has one match and then he's gone from the company a month later. July 16th, 1995 is when he comes in. Oh no. The motherfucker was gone that night. Well, he, he does have one more match. It was a dark yeah. match. against Rad Rad for 10 days later. Okay. Well, in my book, he was gone that night. <laughs> Tell us the story. Okay. So gorilla position and it's just me and i mean and it's small enough for the table my monitor and you know the, the the talent next talent going out and this dumb shit is sitting there he's getting ready to go out and all this stuff and all of a sudden he's got a little little container about you know the, the size of a visine bottle maybe a little bit a little bit bigger and he drops it and next thing i know now i'm like backed up and I'm surrounded by pipe and drape all around me. And then there's the, the curtain that they go out. Well, the fucking pipe, I, I'm on fire. Like the, the gorilla position is on fire. And Kevin Dunn is screaming, send him. And I go, we're on fire. <laughs> he goes, send him. I said, God damn it, gorilla's on fire. Give me a fire extinguisher back here now. The dumb son of a bitch had liquid fire. Some kind of liquid fire that, you know, like whatever magician Jews, I guess, whatever. He was going to like have some fire. That didn't tell anybody. So we haven't had it approved by a fire marshal. He's in a small enclosed area surrounded by flammable drapes. And he fumble fucks, drops the shit. And 
the drapes are going up in fire. And I've got nowhere to go. I'm going to burn because this dumbass doesn't know how to hold on to a little thing of uh, fire. I was livid. Beyond livid. And after this happens, he goes and wrestles a match. Yeah, we were. I think we were live. Maybe not. But yeah, we sent her out. Yeah. I got the fire extinguisher back there and got me put out, but he came, he came back and I, uh, yeah, I had a few choice words for him. Never to be seen again. World's <laughs> shittiest fucking illusionist. That was his best trick was to disappear. Oh, wow. The shits. I ranked that one up with, and, and I, I, I like, uh, Kizarni. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's nice. What's his name? Kizarni? I know that. I, I, yeah. What's his real name? Oh, I don't remember. Great that. guy. Fuck I got him. I got great him. Great guy, man. Oh, um, Sin, Sin Bodhi is his. Sin uh, Bodhi. Yeah. Okay. So, but I mean, now Sin, a little different, a little different, man. I, I, I like Sin a, a whole lot personally. But Sin and um, TNA for like a special event we're bringing people in sin put uh firecrackers around his neck the fire yeah. firecracker tie which is badass uh you know what conrad you may think it's badass but uh when no one knows that you're gonna go out and like firecrackers on a stage loaded with fucking pyro underneath in an enclosed area in a studio at Universal Studios, and you don't tell anybody and get approval for anything like that, and almost blow up the fucking stage. Yeah, no, not good. Security was there waiting for him after his match and kicked him off the property, never to return. I actually knew that story. I yeah. learned it in uh, in Nashville. Yeah, that was not a good one. Yeah. But I, but, but, you know, difference is Sin's a good guy and a good heart and actually like him. But uh, I didn't want to get to know old Her Harry Del Rios, whatever the hell his name was, because he was a shitty illusionist and he almost burned me alive. So fuck him. Fuck him. Well, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but I didn't want to, didn't want to find out. I'm sure uh, after he came through the curtain and you gave him the what for, it was time to hit the road again. And it might be time for you to hit the road again. Thanks to our friends at Camper Max. I'm excited to introduce you to a whole new family opportunity of building memories year round. Camper Max, specializing in max discounted pricing on travel trailers and fifth wheel RVs that are now delivered anywhere in the lower 48. That's right. You can do your shopping from your office, your cell phone, or your couch, and they will deliver it to you. Click or call and find out how easy it is to start enjoying the RVing lifestyle. Now, how easy is it? Well, the Camper Max discount will fit any budget. They offer easy financing with extended terms, so it's really just too easy. Step one, go visit CamperMax.com. That's C-A-M-P-E-R-M-A-X-X.com. Or give them a shout, 256-320-7033. That's CamperMax.com. Remember, there's two X's in Max. CamperMax.com. Or give them a shout, 256-320-7033. When you do that, be sure to mention my name, Conrad. Let them know that I sent you. You're going to get the old friend of a friend discount. I've known these folks who own Camper Max for a long, long time. If you've ever seen or heard about me traveling to a show or an event in an RV, that's because my man, Rod Wagner, hooked it up. Uh, he's a friend of mine, and he's about to be a friend of yours. If you're looking for a fifth wheel, if you're looking for a travel trailer, uh, maybe you're still looking for a motor home. Well, hang in there. My buddy Rod is working on that now. Maybe you're looking to get out of yours, whether you're looking to buy or sell. Camper Max can hook you up. C-A-M-P-E-R-M-A-X-X.com. Be sure to let them know that Conrad sent you. CamperMax.com. Somebody else you probably needed to uh, hit the road. Your old pal Mantar. <laughs> he had hooves, Connie. He had hooves. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he had hooves. This is a character that uh, has been uh, celebrated even this year you want to call it that on NBC, the, uh, the young rock opportunity. I mean, if you get, take a look at this, 
if you're over on something to wrestle.com or check us out on YouTube, you got to just see what the hell we're looking at here. A mythical half man, half beast. Of course, I guess we've all, we've all, maybe not all, a lot of us have heard about minotaurs, but now we've got this bison headdress. Who's gonna, and the performer inside is going to moo and he's going to threaten to gore his opponents and he's going to wear a brown singlet. Looks like it's got some fur on it. And he starts painting black horns on his eyes and forehead and eventually stops wearing this stupid ass head that I think probably made him want to tip over. Believe it or not, though, he wrestled Razor Ramon on Monday night raw in March of 95. And it was all to, uh, help further the feud between razor Ramon and Jeff Jarrett on their way to a WrestleMania 11. Yeah, this is, uh, less than ideal. He's going to, uh, eventually have Jim Cornette become his manager. He must've lost a bet. I mean, I don't even know how that happens, but he picks up some wins over enhancement talent. On- he, he's a fine, he's a fine athlete, Conrad. Oh, gosh. He's, he, he's an amateur. He, he's a, he's a fine amateur. And, and, and by God, he, 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 he can go. Mike Halleck. <sighs> mm. Half man, what? half beast. He had hooves. His, his feet were like hooves. Like, I mean, they were, he was. They were hoovy. They were, they were hooves, like little hooves. Mike wrestled for uh, the German promotion, the CWA. And he comes in here in 94 for you guys as Bruiser Mastino. He picks up two victories over Nikolai Volkov that August, and then he's repackaged as Mantar. But man, the idea because we saw the hooves, and right then we knew he was half man, half beast. He wasn't actually a Bruce Mancino, he was a Mantar. Good God. We had it right there. It was there. He beats an handsome talent. Athlete. Oh gosh. Rob damn is a real thing. Conrad. Chester picks up wins on superstars, raw and wrestling challenge. Uh, his longest feud, most memorable feud. If he had one is against Duke, the dumpster Drose. Drosey. Yeah. We'll get there. Drosey. He's not French. Or well, I want to class this shit show up a little bit. His last on air appearance. Why man, start now? Pronouns about. Yeah, I agree. Okay. He's a lumberjack in the, in your house Two affair between psycho Sid and diesel in July. And then he returns to his bruiser Mastino gimmick and joins ECW briefly pops back up in uh, 1996 at in your house. Good friends, better enemies. He's gold dust unnamed bodyguard there. And he's even going to be tank a member of the truth commission in 1997. So Lord, y'all tried everything for old Mike, but I really need to hear either the pitch of how Jim Cornette wanted to manage Mantar or how it was foisted upon him and how he responded to the idea of managing half man, half beast. Well, I think Bruce, wasn't that, wasn't he with Cornette before he was with us? He may have been, I, maybe he wasn't, I really don't know, but I mean, who else would manage him? This is me. Just basically. He's, he's, he's half man, half beast Conrad. That uh-huh. comes around once every just so often, man. That's not an everyday occurrence. God damn. This is me asking you to do the cornet impression. Oh, I know, but I was waiting for something to do. I did do it. I said, God damn, motherfucker. That's it. He's fucking half man, half beast. He's got fucking hooves. <laughs> you gotta see this son of a bitch. Both of them are like hooves. A goddamn deer, but they're fucking bigger. He's a man. Half man, half beast. He's got hooves. <laughs> I love you. When you get tickled, fuck you, motherfucker. Thank you. Thank you. Fuck you. Next up, Sparky Plug. Sparky Plug. We've covered him in a bomb episode. Check it out in the archives. But yeah, a race car driver. Yeah. He was a race car driver. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying we did it already. All right. We did it already. What about Santa Claus? Yeah. This is an evil wrestling Santa Claus. Yeah. Of course, we also know him as Balls Mahoney, but he was Boo Bradley down in uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. He gets brought up here to play the evil Santa Claus and become part of Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation. But the 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 character quickly fades after oh, yeah. Christmas 1995, 
episode and there's a conflict, I guess, between balls and, and Vince Russo. And next thing you know, balls is gone and he winds up making a name for himself in ECW. Tell what me about conflict with Vince Russo. I don't know. That's just the dirt. But why didn't Santa Claus work better? Because he was an asshole backstage and got drunk and was demanding his money and just not professional. The oh. very first night in. Wow. I don't know anything about Russo. December 17th, 1995 was in your house. Seasons beatings. Of course, this is where we have uh Santa Claus come to the ring, handing out presents as Ted DiBiase is going to berate Savio Vega in the ring. And DiBiase maintains that everyone has a price for the million dollar man until the man in the red suit hits Vega with the bag and reveals himself as Santa Claus. That happens on the 17th of 1995 on the 19th. He beat Scott Taylor on superstars in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and adios. Not long for this world. Yeah, it was the shits, <laughs> but you know, I mean, look, Santa's got to have a, an adversary. Yeah. Bizarro Superman deal. Yeah, I get it. Exactly. So he was Santa Claus. He was exactly the opposite of Santa Claus. They spelled it different too. So this what one had a K. It was KL versus C. C. Yeah. What about uh, the goon? Wild Bill Irwin is going to play a hockey player who's just too awesome. awesome for the NHL. He's going to wear a New Jersey Jevil inspired white sweater without a logo and the name goon on his back. And the boots are actually made to look like skates with the blades removed. I mean, that was actually a nice touch. But. Yeah, this character. Maybe. I credit Bill Irwin with that, you know, with the boots and everything. That was his idea uh, to make him look like skates, and, and he was a skater. And the idea came from, this is another one, life imitating art. When Bill was growing up, Bill played hockey, and Bill was the goon on the hockey team, the guy that they would send into the game to take out the best player on the other side by getting in a fight with them, and they called them goons. Bill was a goon growing up and had played hockey so it was like oh my god you know we never had a goon before so the goon was born oh it was a great gimmick maybe his most notable match is when he comes back uh for the gimmick battle royal in 2001 but the character only runs like i don't know six or seven months from the summer until maybe the and we fired up man we had a hell of a battle in the in the corner me and the old goon i least like sincerely i remember seeing him on um superstars and stuff the the bell would ring and then he would throw his gloves off throw shit down and it was on that was fun that's that what a goon fun. did man yes that's good shit uh speaking of not so good shit duke the dumpster drossy yes great shit a garbage man yeah ready to take out the trash here in the wwf and by the way, this is not totally all your idea. He wrestled on Florida independence as garbage man. So he joins the company in 1994. He's going to bring a trash can to the ring. He's going to feud with Jerry Lawler and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. And then he's out of here. His last match is uh, July of 96 against Al snow in Providence, Rhode Island. This is the, maybe the epitome of the occupational gimmick. When you, when somebody says occupational gimmick, is this the one you automatically think of? I don't know, but it was, it was a good gimmick. It was fun. I enjoyed doing the vignettes traveling with, <laughs> we actually uh, traveled with the Stanford sanitation department while they were out doing their runs. And we went behind him with the camera and shot. He actually was garbage man kind of for half a day. Wow. It's tremendous. Next up your boy. Aldo Montoya, uh, it's just incredible with a jock strap on his face. PJ Walker here, who I guess is like an adopted member of the clique and not quite yet. Just incredible. He's the Portuguese man of war. And you've said before that he looked like Jerry Seinfeld. You guys, that was Jerry Lawler's thing. Yeah. Uh, he does have a, a little bit of a program where he gets the shit kicked out of him by Jerry Lawler. And he has a small program with Jeff Jarrett over the intercontinental title. We should remind everybody dude was really young here, but how does he wind up with a jock strap on his face? Cause he's all the Montoya Portuguese man of war. 
Yeah. You know, hey, look, it it was one of the silliest things. This is again sometimes where you get into dangerous territory is people that don't understand. And there was a marketing department at the time that they were trying to present us with gimmicks and they met, you know, we talked, told them about this guy, um, PJ, that was also Montoya and he's Portuguese and we want to make a Portuguese, you know, type gimmick. So they made him a soccer player and it'll be great. You know, go to the ring, you know, kick soccer balls into the audience and it'll be, you know, fabulous. And we'll kick all these soccer balls out and he'll do this. And he'll do that. And they're presenting all of this to us and, Classic, famous last words. Can he play soccer? Uh, we don't know. Well, then how in the fuck do you come up with a soccer player that can't play soccer? Right. You know, I mean, does he even like soccer? You know, the answer was no. But he was Portuguese, and he spoke Portuguese. Uh, so he's a Portuguese man of war. Um, just to change it up, you know, his... his uh, he looked very, he was very young. He looked very young to cover up his face and probably all time worst fucking mask of all times. The worst fucking mask of all time? Yeah. Okay. Next up, Man Mountain Rock. He's uh, named after Man Mountain Dean, a guitar player. Uh, he, he'd come over from uh, WCW after his release and was recommended to the WWE. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Who's Man Mountain Dean? Man okay. Mountain Dean was an old time wrestler, but there was, I don't know any guitar. That's not what he wasn't named after a guitar player named Man Mountain Dean. Oh yeah, you're right. He's a guitar player who, uh, but Man Mountain Dean is the prior, you get where I'm going. He, he's a motherfucking big ass wrestler who plays a guitar. And there was a Man Mountain Dean before, but now he's Man Mountain Rock because he plays rock music. Get it? Yeah. I, I, I never, we never, I never knew of any Man Mountain Dean that played guitar. No, but there is a man mountain rock that does. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it, 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 what was his name? Daryl Peterson or something like that. Um, and he, he was another one, a hell of an amateur man, uh, badass. And he was, you know, look, he played, played guitar, wanted to be a rock star and kind of fancy himself that way. And he, he looked like a big mountain, you know, we talked about man mountain Dean, the old wrestler who used to be in overalls and all this shit. But since he's a rocker, he now be it's obvious making man mountain rock because he's a rocker and he's a man and he's a mountain of a man. Therefore, man mountain rock. It writes itself. The WWF shaped guitar. Mm -hmm. Whose idea is that? Oof. Um, That's a cool you know, guitar. I, I, I actually, I think that. Uh, that was actually probably Daryl's in the beginning. You know, hey, what if we had a guitar like this and we, we made it? Well, it looks cool. I wish I could find one. That's a cool yeah. collection. It dis funny, it disappeared. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, something that did appear that we haven't spent any time talking about, because he's only around here for a short time in 1995. Maybe his most well-known contribution here in the company is the behind-the-scenes footage that he filmed and then turned into a documentary He's really leaking out private time with all the guys. And I don't know. Did you feel like that was a betrayal of trust and something that shouldn't have happened? Absolutely. I think that, I think that behind the scenes, and I think that especially in a locker room that that is, you know, a sanctuary that I don't think outsiders should be, uh, you Privative. know, that, that's, that's your safe haven. That's where yep. you can go. You can go in the locker room you get away from everybody. You're just in there with your contemporaries and your friends and you don't have to worry about, you know, family members walking in or anything else like that. And you can be yourself and let your hair down and whatever happens in the dressing room stays in the dressing room. And I, I do think that was not cool. Well, something else that wasn't cool. Uh, and boy, I hate to phrase it that way, but techno team 2000 oh, was supposed to be the wrestling team from the future. They don't have much of a future here though. They come in March 19th, 1995. It's Eric Watts and Chad fortune. And if you're wondering, yes, this is the era where bill Watts was hanging around the WWF and Eric has said the plan was for them to be champions within a few months, but of course they're only here until July. So 
March of 95 to July of 95. Why did old techno team 2000 not make it? Well, Conrad, it got an old saying in the uh, wrestling world, the damn bell rings. Yeah. That was it. Just, it was, they weren't any good. It, is it a, a Chad fortune issue or a, an Eric Watts issue or both combination? The gimmick was hokey and it just didn't, didn't fit. I think that, you know, I, I think that they came in thinking they were going to be over and it's even if you had a run somewhere else and you, you come in and you think, Oh, I'm over. They know me. You still have to get over. Yeah. New audience, new, new place. You have to get over. And they just never got over by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I'll tell you something that's over with all of us. And that's Jimmy's famous seafood.com. I am so mm -hmm. pumped that they are sponsoring our show because now we get to remind the world that they have the best crab cakes in the world. It's not even a secret. Everybody in wrestling knows it. It is the most famous wrestling restaurant of all time. It is much more than just a gimmick though. Sincerely, the best crab cakes in the world. If you have them, here's a warning. You will be ruined. You won't order crab cakes anywhere else. Now, here's what's cool about Jimmy's famous seafood.com. You may not have known that they ship food nationwide, not only for guys like me and you, but the Bowies, they order their meals from here all the time. But here's a little pro tip. When you're ordering high quality cuisine like this, the tricky part is the shipping can get expensive. What if we showed you how to make it free? That's right. Free two day nationwide shipping on orders over 125 bucks. When you use the promo code wrestle. Now you can get the Maryland crab cakes, the best you've ever had. The soups, the chowders, the oysters, the signature steaks. Don't sleep on those. The best prime rib I ever had was from Jimmy's famous seafood. Plus they got incredible desserts, even gluten free items. Now they've got gift boxes. If you're trying to figure out what that last minute gift for somebody in your life should be. Somebody who's hard to buy for. Nobody ever complains about the world's best colossal Maryland crab cakes. You'll get four of them in the famous gift box. You'll also get two different crab soups, a crab dip, seafood seasoning, and their signature bay sauce. Or maybe it's time for bowl season. Maybe you're getting ready for those playoffs. Why not a tailgate bundle? It's two pounds of wings, a full rack of ribs, a pint of crab dip, and even the crab cake mix. Or better yet, just create your own package. For over 40 years, this family, that's right, a family-owned business. Don't you just love that? Has been featured on diners, dine-ins, and dives, beat Bobby Flay, and so much more. Bruce Pritchard and I have done shows here. We go every time we're in Maryland. And Bruce, you were going way back when in the 90s. But right now, you can have it delivered to your house with free shipping. When you use the promo code WRESTLE, at Jimmy's famous seafood.com. Can't say enough nice things about Jimmy's. Can we dude? Love Jimmy's love John. Love this music. And so help me God. If you love seafood, there's only one place to get it. And that's at Jimmy's famous seafood. And the crab cakes are to die for not a bad thing on the menu. I, uh, I got mine being delivered tomorrow, just in time for our Christmas Eve dinner. I ordered some, mini stuffed shrimp and i ordered uh, some crab balls which is just a miniature version of the giant crab cakes mm -hmm. i even ordered my filet mignon from uh from there at jimmy's and it's all getting delivered tomorrow that's what my family's eating for christmas eve yours can well. got crab cakes and the uh crab soup how do you beat it you just don't go to jimmyseafood.com just try it you won't regret it jimmy's famous seafood.com the promo code is wrestle and hey, man, don't forget to brush after you eat that Jimmy's Famous Seafood or else you might be going to the dentist. And I hope he's not an evil dentist. One may be named Isaac Yankum, DDS. This is Jerry Lawler's Wrestling Dentist. And maybe this is the second most, at least in my mind, prolific occupational gimmick. Glenn Jacobs is constantly being repackaged here in the company. Uh, and uh, this is maybe the best we come up with at this point. But thankfully, Kane is not too far away. But hey, Isaac Yankum got a SummerSlam match against Bret Hart in a steel cage. And uh, he disappeared not much longer after being repackaged as Kane. What'd you think of, uh, well, I guess he's going to be fake diesel first. What'd you think of Isaac Yankum, did he ask? I Yankum, get it? 
He's a dentist. I yeah. yank him. Get it? I, I did. I got it. Oh, okay. Ah, <laughs> you know, Bobby Heenan got to see his uh, his joke come to life. You know, Bobby loved that. Hey, what if we had a dentist? I yank him. Isaac yank him. I yank him. Get it? Yeah, it was silly. I mean, listen. Uh, I think that I think Glenn's career came out okay in the end. Worked out just fine. Just fine. And as a reminder, you know, we, we you said you liked IRS Irwin R Shyster. Yeah. Maybe not so much Isaac Yankum. I liked I Yankum. Yeah. Well, how'd you feel about Dean Douglas, the wrestling teacher? Well. I think that I think Shane was so caught up in trying to be a character versus being himself. Um, and then plus everything else, you know, with, you know, the problems with the click and all that other wonderful shit that, I thought it could have been really good for him. I really do. Uh, I think that uh, his promos, but I think that Shane was just too concerned with like the gimmick part of it, that he was a natural, I mean, he's just a natural talker. He's a natural heat seeker. And, you know, being a teacher, it, it was it's what he did. It's It's like, man, this is, an extension of his personality. I just don't think it ever really fit. I don't think he was ever comfortable in it. And that's just the bottom line. It's a shame because he did have great success in WCW and ECW, but he's only here like five or six months. And that's all she wrote. Yep. Uh, I can see a wrestling teacher again. It's another one of those occupational gimmicks, but I could see that one working, you know, especially for yes, trying to market to kids and all that. Yep. Well, something that uh, didn't have much of a chance. The wrestling plumber we know as T.L. Hopper, uh, dirty white boy Tony Anthony, finally makes it to the big time after working these southern territories. But he's a plumber. He's going to wear low hanging jeans and a stained undershirt and going to carry a plunger named Betsy. Uh, finally, he gets a big win, though, when he beats the garbage man. And his biggest achievement might have been fishing out the turd that was in the pool on the pre show known as the free for all for SummerSlam 1996. It was uh, a scene taken right out of Caddyshack and he starts in 96, makes it until June of 97 until he comes back as uncle Cletus with the Godwins. What, uh, what do you remember about TL Hopper, the wrestling plumber? Well, it's Tony Anthony and Tony Anthony was a plumber in real life. I don't think Tony was even, uh, working in the business at that time. He was a plumber by trade. And when we heard that, it was like, oh, my God, you know, he can be a plumber. We never had a plumber before. And, uh, <laughs> you know, T.L. Hopper, toilet paper hopper, because he takes care of the hopper. You know, T.L. toilet paper hopper. And, um, yeah. That's why, would he, why would he be T.P. Hopper? Yeah, I don't know. Because, you know. Yeah. Do you remember Beavis and Butthead? I never watched it, but I know what it is. You know what it is? Yeah. They used to put their shirts around their head. I need TP for my bunghole. I can see TP Hopper. That makes more sense than TL Hopper. Toilet lid. Oh, okay. All righty. Well, uh, something we were ready to flush is Tracy Smothers being known as Freddie Joe Floyd. Yeah. I don't really even understand how this is a gimmick much as it is just an homage to easy, easy looking for a name for him. And JR's like, Hey, Hey, uh, uh, Jerry Briscoe had his, uh, his Delta tag on his back. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, Floyd. You yeah. Know, making fun of Jerry's real first name, Floyd F G Briscoe. And, uh, <laughs> Jerry <laughs> blurts out. He goes, Oh yeah. Jack's real name is Freddie Joe. And Freddie Joe Floyd was born. Wow. How about that? Yeah. He debuts, uh, June 26th, 1996. He's gone by June 2nd, 1997, but, uh, he does get some, some TV matches here and there against JBL mankind, triple H and uncle Zeb. 
but maybe one of my favorites that uh, I'm glad we're able to squeeze in here today. Of course, there's no way we can get the entire box of gimmicks through. We're over two hours already, but what about who? 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 He's a guy with a bird on his mask. I think uh, it's a big, nasty rhino who needs a job. Maybe. Who? Who? Yeah. Serious business. Uh, the mask. Uh, what? No, who? Well, yes, correct. Who? What are we thinking with who? Well, you had to guess who it, who it was. You didn't know who it was because they were in a mask. Well, with that barrel you, mask, you we know. Ask the question, who? And that's who he was. If he shaved his red chest hair off, I might have had more trouble guessing. Yeah, he's big. He got the fucking. He needs a big fucking rhino, and he he's a big bash. He's a strong you know, fucking rhino. Can you do something? Good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, we're so, who, are we out of ideas? Is this just uh let's just throw it against the wall? Man, you know what? It was, it was more of a, just put him under a mask and let him be who, and people all know who it is, but at least we don't have Jim Neidhart on the show. And, and I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. What I mean by that is, um, didn't, and, didn't want the, Jim had, had had some, you know, rough stints and didn't was like, okay, we've, we've done night heart to death. Okay. Is a favor to Stu and, and, you know, Jim too. I mean, goddamn, been with, been with us forever and let's, let's do it again, but put him on a mask. He needed the fresh coat of paint. Yeah. Or let's fresh paint coat. There you go. Last, but certainly not least your boy. Charles Warrington is going to let us know about beaver cleavage. Uh, this is a, a skit that we're going to do for a parody, I guess, of leave it to beaver with a sexy mom and incestuous undertones and maybe one of the more uncomfortable gimmicks in history. And we all remember him as being mosh one half of the headbangers from 96 to 99. But when the team dissolves, uh, because thrasher has an injury, old beaver still needs to, uh, get paid. So we come up with this, leave it to beaver spoof. If you will, black and white vignettes and he's got a sexy mama here with them things out. And he's going to turn to the camera and say, when it comes to working on your knees, my mom is the expert and I have a laugh track play. You've, uh, you've talked in the past, how you think or you remember people saying that the real life guy resembled Beaver Cleaver. Well, yeah, he had a driver's license and somebody said to him or something, he looked like leave it to Beaver, uh, uh, Beaver Cleaver and told me that. And I was laughing about it and, uh, mentioned it to Vince Russo and next thing you know, poor old Chaz was Beaver Cleavage. The. That's not the end of the bad ideas though. Uh, eventually he starts going by Chaz and it's revealed that Mrs. Cleavage is actually his girlfriend, Mariana. And I think there was supposed to be a storyline where Mariana claimed that Chaz abused her and she tried to get Chaz arrested. Thrasher comes back in October of 99 on Sunday night heat and reveals that Mariana had applied makeup to look like a facial bruise and that cleared Chaz of domestic abuse. What are we doing? Not it. <laughs> this is just uh Vince Russo one oh one, huh? Not it. Yeah. I'll well, take credit for my bad shit. As I mean, we we rattled through a bunch of bad ones here today. I don't know if uh, if Silva can sort of rapid fire us some of these. Does one stand out as worse than the other? I mean, we didn't get to all of them. We got to do a part two some other time, but you know, and again, I, I look, there were, there were a lot of bad ones, but there were also a lot of great ones as well. Uh, for me, the, the worst was I hated Rio Rogers. I, I hated the idea of it. I hated doing it. Um, but that's personal for me. I, I did, did not like it. 
and you know you got your your repo mans in there and, and things of that nature but it just didn't fit um but you know keen was great outback jack all those guys i mean a lot of them were great and a lot of them you know could have been great but it just kind of was what it was as we're uh, we're scrolling through some of the bad gimmicks here i hope you're watching along at something to wrestle.com Let's do a few questions here. Then we'll wrap this one up. FF handbook says, is there a rule of thumb on how many times a talent is repackaged into a new gimmick? Godfather Kane and Rikishi took a bunch of tries to get it right. How do you know which people to keep repackaging and which to future endeavor? Great question. Well, a lot of times it depends on the human being behind the gimmick and the human being behind the gimmick may be worthy of a second, third and or fourth chance. And that's pretty much the criteria. The Rosen coaster says, was there ever a gimmick that Vince pitched that he absolutely loved, but unanimously everyone else in the room hated, but you know, you had to go along with it anyway, because he's the boss. Um, God, I'm sure, I'm sure there have been nothing comes to the top of mind. Francis Reyes says, was there a gimmick that you thought could have turned around with more time? You know, uh, again, I, I think that there were certain gimmicks that had they had a little bit put into them. And, and I keep going back to the rooster. I think the rooster could have been really good for Terry if he had just put a little bit more into it. Um, and, you know, some really took off again, like IRS. I think that was a great gimmick for Mike. And I thought that he did a great job with it. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, we've sort of touched on this before. Adam Leeson says, if someone else played the undertaker, would that gimmick have been on this podcast? Probably not. I, uh, well, I mean, probably. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, again, he, he made that character, made that gimmick work. The human being did just like doing the clown, the human being, Matt Bourne made that gimmick. Everybody that played it after that, not doing the clown to me. Brian says, Absolutely no questions because we all already know if Vince doesn't see a gimmick as the main event of WrestleMania, then he doesn't want to waste TV time on it. So obviously the only reason why Bastion Booger never got his WrestleMania moment is because he didn't embrace the gimmick enough, right? Yeah, because right. he's El Succoed. Well, there you go. One last one. Sean Daniels wants to know which failed gimmick, in your opinion, did you believe at the time would have had the best long term success? Whether we're talking, you know, merchandise sales or ratings or programs or whatever, but a failed gimmick that you would have thought, man, that'll work. And it just didn't. Oh boy. I, again, off the top of my head, I, I don't really know. I, th I think there were, you know, a few and, and it really depends a lot of times, as I said before, if you had someone else in that gimmick, it's, you know, the bad example is people thinking that Terry Taylor should have been Mr. Perfect. No, he shouldn't have because, you know, Kurt Hennig was Mr. Perfect. It's just different. And it's, it's a feel thing. So, um, it really depends on the individuals behind the gimmicks that, that really is the determining factor. Well, we have determined that we are going to have a great Christmas and we hope you are too. I can't believe it's finally here. Uh, let's remember the reason for the season and try to spend as much of this weekend as we can with our friends and family and our loved ones. I know it's been a trying year for a lot of us and, uh, some of us have lost folks and, um, boy, I don't mean to be negative, but I know that tomorrow's not promised. And I had some folks in my life this time last year and last year was my last Christmas with them. So as a result this year, I'm going to hug everybody a little tighter. I'm going to take the picture. I'm going to try to make those memories and. I hope you will too. Let's, uh, let's remember good times. Like hopefully we're all going to be having this weekend and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, a little break from some of the holiday hubbub and celebration and maybe some traveling around and enjoyed a little trip down memory lane with some of the, the worst or maybe the best of the box of gimmicks. We'd love to have you uh, check us out on YouTube. If you haven't already, it's something to wrestle.com hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications bell. Uh, you can participate in the conversation with us by following us on Twitter. It's at Pritchard show on Twitter and Instagram, something to wrestle on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram. At, hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson and Twitter. At, hey, Hey, it's Conrad. If you'd like to stare at Bruce's account that never will tweet, it's at Bruce Pritchard. 
And, uh, if you're still looking for something to get for the wrestling fan in your life, maybe you forgot somebody or you need to ship them something, or it's a stocking stuffer. We want to recommend our old pal, Eric's book. It's over on Amazon right now. It's grateful. You can also push it up, pick it up at bischoffbook.com, but grateful just type in grateful and Eric Bischoff and amazon.com. And there it shall be. And the rumor is Bruce that, uh, you're getting a copy just in time for Christmas. Have you cracked it open yet? Yeah, I haven't gotten it yet. Oh yeah. Maybe, maybe saying the, the heat continues to escalate. Maybe Santa will bring it. You think so? I hope so. I believe in Santa. Don't you I believe in Santa? Oh God. No, you don't. He, no. He's an asshole backstage and yeah, his money. Oh, speaking of demanding money, if you'd like to skip your next two house payments, that's right. No house payments in January or in February, you're done until March 1st. Get on over to save with Conrad.com. Maybe you're taking a look under that Christmas tree and thinking, man, isn't that nice? But now i got to pay for it all. I've learned that on average, it takes families about six months to pay off their credit card debt. They racked up over the Christmas vacation. Let's knock it all out. Just like that. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but your house is worth more than ever before right now. Why not use some of that newfound equity to make your life a whole heck of a lot easier. We can knock out your second mortgage, your credit cards, even a car payment. It's going to get you a cheaper monthly payment going to save you a whole boatload of cash. Let you skip a couple of payments and oh yeah, we can even show you how to pay your house off faster. That's sort of the magic trick in all this. We're not going to try to set gorilla on fire, but I do want to let you know that I'm routinely helping folks get out of a 30 year loan and get down to a 15 year term. So they're paying their house off in half the time, but by knocking out all that credit card debt, they're doing it with cheaper monthly payments. And you don't have to take my word for it. Read some of our reviews, man. And there are a ton of five-star reviews. If you go to conradreviews.com, you'll see that we've got thousands, I mean, just tons of reviews. And our average rating is 4.72. That's pretty, pretty, pretty good. Here's a five-star review from our man Donald in Ohio. I was not at all in the market for a house given the current economy, but the one house I wanted came on the market. Conrad's team made it happen with the least amount of money out of pocket. Thanks to Conrad and Jimmy's hard work, I have the house I wanted. So whether you're looking to buy or refinance or consolidate debt, remodel, whatever you're looking for, I can hook you up at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender, savewithconrad.com. And if you want, just drop me an email, conrad at savewithconrad.com. You'll really get me at conrad at savewithconrad.com. That's it, Bruce. We're at the end, man. The box of gimmicks. Let's play that music out, Silva. Let's just keep it going as we close. Are you doing a turkey? Yep. You got a fry turkey, cake? crab cakes. Yep. I'm still smoking. The only, way I, can, the only yeah. way I can do it anymore is fried turkey. I'm smoking mine again. A little cage in action. It's going to be good. But you, what kind of paper do you use to roll it or do you use a pipe? I love you for that. Uh, no, actually, Christmas Eve. So tomorrow night, we're doing the, the, the Jimmy's deal with the fillets and the shrimps and the crabs and all that. But on Christmas Day, we're going to Mama's house. I'm taking the turkey and I'm going to get up at the crack of dawn, slide on the rec tech. I would have rubbed it down the night before with some Cajun. A little injection. Injected, little, yeah, both. We do the rubs and the injection. Got to. Yeah, there it is. I don't know why we're on me now. I'm just excited about this Cajun turkey and this music's playing me out. And I'm in the holiday spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to Something to Wrestle. Tell your friends, Bruce is back, by God. And the show is better than ever. Something to wrestle.com. We'll see you next week right here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. And I want to wish each and every one of you a very happy holiday, whether it's Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is that you wish to celebrate in this holiday season. The very best to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for watching us. I greatly appreciate it. And I truly do love each and every one of you. And from me to you, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Rock On. See you next week.